listening to Phenomenology Club Radio. Hello everybody, thank you for listening. I am Buttress and this is Phenomenology Club Book Club American Politics Edition. Due to current events, we have put our regular book club series on a temporary hiatus and instead are choosing to use this reserve time to discuss instead a variety of political texts and texts by black activists and thinkers relating to the structures of American politics and racism. For our first meeting, we read two texts. Firstly, the U.S. Constitution in full, which is a very short document, and there is no reason any of us who are citizens of the United States of Triple K America cannot read this document in full if we have not or have not in a long time, and then a supplementary text by ex-Black Panther turned anarchist Lorenzo Camboa Irvin titled Anarchism and the Black Revolution. What we'll be doing for this series, which meets every Sunday into the foreseeable future in our free and public new Discord server, meaning anybody can join. I've put that link in the description for this upload, and it can also be accessed at any time on our website, www.phenomenology.club. Scroll down to the public outreach section where there is a link to that server. What we'll be doing for the next few weeks, we meet every Sunday into the foreseeable future, is discussing various texts relating to the U.S. legal system, as well as texts by black activists and thinkers to put all of these readings into the broader perspective of wondering how best to strategize towards things like the dissolution of American racism which is structural and woven into our legal system at every observable level. Before I play this audio for you here in a second, I just want to say apologies. We were having some audio difficulties in the first 16 minutes or so are warped. It is listenable, but a little difficult to listen to. Sorry for that. Um, Also, there is some indeterminate amount of time that passes after these first 16 minutes until the next clip because we were having some problems again i'm sorry for that hopefully this will not be true of our next meeting which i will also upload the audio from i hope you enjoy this discussion and find it insightful if you would like to read any of these texts that we're discussing please go to our website once again www.phenomenology.club there are linked pdfs to all of the texts that we read and discuss here as well as an invite to our discord server which again i encourage you to join if you would like to participate in these discussions when they happen or join in any of the text discussions that happen in there as well thank you for listening hope you're all safe out there and thinking critically amidst this historical moment in time. Did you guys hear that? I did, thank goodness. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, we're good now, I think. Perfect, okay. All right, welcome everybody to our first ever public phenomenology club discussion. Usually we have a um, book club reading series where we read and discuss philosophy texts in our private members only server, which you can join at um, at any time for only $1 uh, via the Patreon or our website, www.phenomenologyclub. But I made this public server because I wanted to invite people to have some discussions with us um relating to some political text as we are experiencing a very historical moment right now and i think that it's in the best interest of all americans to be doing what we're about to do reading and discussing a great detail of political text so here we are welcome everybody um like i said Uh, If you're having any problems connecting to the audio or any of this, um, scroll all the way up to the top of the chat text and look at the note that I have there. Uh, I have some troubleshooting tips. Also, if you prefer not to talk at all, uh, you can also type into the main chat box and we'll just, I'll try to uh, address anything I see in there when I see it. Um, But yeah, let's, let's do it. Oh yeah, and also when you start talking, 
um, maybe introduce yourself with your name or username if you're not comfortable. Um, and if you're comfortable, tell us where you're speaking to us from because we're interested in such things. Also, I mean, I am the club discussion leader right now. Uh, usually what we do in book club is um, start with kind of an introduction given by myself and then open the floor to more discussion. But at any time, if you feel you want to interject or anything, I mean, unless it gets crazy, we do have a lot of people in here. But if you want to say something, just speak up. Please don't be shy. Um, I'll try my best to maintain law and order. So, what we read for tonight's discussion was two texts. Um, firstly, the U.S. Constitution, which... I don't know if I've ever sat down and read from start to finish, actually, until we did it this week. Which is kind of crazy when I think about it. And also this text by Lorenzo Camboa Urban called Anarchism and the Black Revolution, written in 1993. Lorenzo is an ex-Black Panther member, still living, um, turned anarchist. And this text I saw because... Because Zach Fox, he's my friend and such an amazing person, you should all be following on social media and all this shit. He's a very talented comedian and artist and amazing overall person. He was posting excerpts from this text um, on his Instagram live feed. And in reading it, I felt that this would be a great accompanying piece to our reading of the U.S. Constitution. Because it lays down... A sort of theoretical groundwork for how we can mentally approach this issue of police brutality for one which is the explicit thing uh, that people are protesting against in every state in America right now uh, which is crazy um, and it, it it helps establish I think a bit of a broader context for how we want to go into a thing like a reading of the U.S. Constitution if we're going into it with the interest of you know, specifically trying to think about how our law enables and propagates structural racism in America. Um, like I said in the when I posted the link, I'm not going to go into some sort of explicit discussion about this text. Um, much of the text in Lorenzo speaking directly to the black community, which I am not a member of, um, and laying down what he thinks are the most meaningful approaches for black liberation efforts. This is the majority of the text, but I feel that the first few sections especially are relevant for uh, people who are trying to understand a bit better exactly how racism functions in America and also in the world. Um, he says in the beginning of this text that the purpose of this text is to introduce black liberation efforts to anarchism. And he feels as if both the left and the right wing uh, in America have a lot of misconstrued ideas about what the goals of anarchism actually are and how it functions. Um, and I mean, his, his writings is just one of many, you know, this is not supposed to... I, I picked this reading because I felt that it was relevant to everything going on, obviously, but, you know, we should all be reading black activist writings that come from multiple perspectives. I mean, in this text, Lorenzo is criticizing Marxist-Leninists, he's criticizing liberals, you know, but there's also black liberals, there's black Marxist-Leninists, and we should be reading all of these people and getting the most diverse accumulation of perspectives from the black community if we want to be, or people like myself, white people want to be useful in black liberation efforts. Uh, you know, the first thing we have to do is gain a comprehensive understanding of what the black community actually is fighting for and how best to achieve it because no one will understand this better than them. So, in this text, one of the most fundamental uh, principles that he's trying to hammer home in the beginning is this idea that capitalism itself, which is the global mode 
right now, the whole world is really functioning within an overarching capitalist structure. He talks about how, in America specifically, capitalism is racist. Because capitalism, or rather the fate of the white working class, he says, has been in Basically bound to the class of black laborers ever since the beginning of this country. And in this sense, the two cannot be separated. And in the capitalist society of the United States, we know that the number one variable for having any sort of social mobility is to move within capitalism to do things like get fucking rich, which affords you more social mobility, you know. This is the number one way that people are able to move in American society, period. Um, And so, of course, if we want to have any sort of revolutionary movement, um, it needs to have, it needs to explicitly be concerned with white supremacy and racism, specifically towards black Americans. Uh, in the U.S. And I think that this is a really, really key point that uh, people should be concerned with right now. I mean, always, but some of the things he's doing when he's criticizing uh, even the anarchist movements um, going on when he wrote this text in 1993 and the Marxist-Leninist and all this, uh, he feels as if there is not enough of an ex- explicit focus on white supremacy, dismantling white supremacy, and also uh, understanding how racism works on an actual structural level. Um, And he says that there can be no revolutionary movement without doing this first, you know? And I think that this is a really salient point, you know, that something like white supremacy which is so integral to the structures of capitalism and U.S. law, period. There can be no revolutionary mo- movement, and uh, white supremacy can't be treated as some sort of a footnote in any efforts for any revolutionary cause. It must be ad- addressed explicitly. He, he does things like, um, discusses how he feels as if white anarchist movements, because he's speaking to anarchists specifically because he himself is an anarchist, he said that they need to form actual, like, anti-racist coalitions, or he gives an example of an anti-racist coalition and how they work, and says that that white people, white revolutionaries, they need to create organizations like this to actually do specific outreach to the black community and form solidarity on that basis of fighting racism and dismantling white supremacy. It needs to be an explicit priority of any movement like this. And he raises really good points uh, for this idea. Um, Look at my notes. I think, too, that something he said that was really interesting um, is is that when it comes to black liberation efforts, he says that there's two options, really. The one option is to have some sort of complete revolutionary overhaul of our current system. And the other option is to secure wins under capitalism. Things like uh, the civil rights movement. He identifies the civil rights movement as working within this mode of capitalism, where the the wins of the civil rights movements are basically wins that are achieved by functioning within the mode of U.S. law and capitalism. And he says that either of these approaches is acceptable. He, I think he clearly prefers to have more revolutionary approaches, but he also, he also speaks much about how, about how working within the current system and trying to gain whatever wins are possible is still an important thing to be doing, while also remaining mindful of the idea that uh, it's a very liberal attitude to act as if this entire problem is simply one that can be thwarted by being proactive and electing black officials and, you know, doing all uh, all types of outreach, fighting racist 
ideology and stuff like this. He's very cynical of this attitude that he feels liberals, especially in the liberal Democratic Party, uh, are embroiled in, which is that, um, you know, this is sort of a moral battle. It's almost akin to some sort of a spiritual battle. I think that this is a battle in our present day still, you know, this text is from about 30 years ago, but I think that something that is kind of poignant about this moment in time is I'm seeing white people speak now more than ever about how they're trying to communicate to other white people that racism is not simply some sort of a moral issue. All these cute little videos those of black and white kids hugging with the fucking little italic font, like, oh, like, kids don't see whatever, I don't know, whatever kind of feel good shit, you know, this is how a lot of white people approach the issue of racism. As if it's just some sort of moral struggle, and as soon as people open their eyes to the reality that skin color is such an arbitrary factor in the social worth of individuals, sorry, my phone just vibrated, hold on. They, they treat the issue as if we can solve racism by this, but uh, as Lorenzo talks about in this text, this is not possible. Um, so he goes through some specific ideas before he gets into his uh, addressing specifically to, uh, of the black community and is speaking directly to them. Um, he talks about what kinds of things need to happen and what white people should also be fighting for. Um, alongside black liberation efforts, one of these things is class solidarity, a thing that he believes cannot exist without white people actively working to dismantle white supremacy. Um, and he has this itemized list. And Number four, he speaks about community control of the police. Uh, having elected police uh, members, I don't know if he would still call them police members, um, and fighting against police brutality, and the prosecution of all killer cops, which is a thing that I think we need to really be talking about right now, too, you know. Um, and I think we'll get into that discussion in a second. And, well, when we talk about Constitution, but... But he's making a specific legislative proposition here that we need to prosecute all killer policemen, which is absolutely true. Um, money to rebuild. He also calls for the banning of the KKK, Nazis, and other fascists. Um, and prosecution of racist attacks, which is something that really doesn't exist to any measurable degree. I mean, the U.S. has such shoddy laws as it relates to things like hate crimes and shit. This is definitely something we should also be thinking about as we do things like read the U.S. Constitution and try to find ways we can strategize towards making things better while also working within the broader goal of having more revolutionary movements. Um, he also suggests ending attacks on workers and the poor, which I think is really interesting, something that I have not heard. And item number 11, he speaks about abolishing prisons, um, which is another thing that is really relevant to our current discussions as we're talking about dismantling police departments and prisons and all this. Um, So th this, these first four sections, this is really, this is the part, I mean, everybody should read the entire thing. It was sort of long. Um, and the majority of it is him speaking directly to the black community. Um, and the other things we should be mindful of as well, obviously. But, but these first four sections, I think, really can help give even white people sort of a theoretical framework for what they should be thinking. Man, Discord is being weird. Torn. I literally okay. can't fucking hear. Hold on, I'm going to adjust the bitrate. Um, maybe that will help us. It's awfully high and we have a lot of people in here, so let me change that. I'm going to lower it. Okay, I've changed that. 
Am I still cutting out? Can you guys hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I don't know what's going on. Um, I don't know why Tick can't talk. That's strange. Um, Torn, would you like to say something? Um, I guess regarding the first section, from what I believe, yeah. racism. It's 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 like there's so many of us like. You can't just have like you can't just picture it just being one marginalized group. It's just like it's, it's everybody and like as but as far as America, I do feel like the people who do speak the loudest just come from like people of uh and the one thing that I see is that they say that although black people only make up thirteen percent of America, we commit fifty percent of crime. And I could I could say this much though, people. We make the world go round, like, shit, like, a little bit of an example, like, shit, or something like that. My weed dealer Wait, might be a you white You just dude. cut out. <laughs> oh. What was the example? What was the example? <laughs> like, I might, give, I, I might give money to my weed dealer or something like that. Like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm in Georgia, so no, weed isn't legal. Like, I haven't smoked weed in, like, months, months and months. I was in Michigan. <laughs> fuck all that bullshit. Uh, but, like, I might give money to my weed dealer. And he might be a white dude or something like that. We're we're all controlled by money. He, he I need to work to make that money. He's working to make his money, but in the end, it's still a common exchange. Like we both need like like something out of this. There's got to be a takeaway. There's got to be something to give. So like you can mm -hmm. take what you will from that. But like as far as racism, we can change it right now if we wanted to. Like if 100% is on board, if 75% of people are on board. If sixty percent, and then it's just down for the count, like police brutality. In my opinion, it it will always exist. Like how many police are in America, and how many people are in the Klan? Like I've personally, I, I don't really have anything against the Klan. I haven't met too many Klan members in my life, and if they are in the Klan, they wouldn't tell me. Like <laughs> you don't uh, have anything against the Klan, you're saying? <laughs> I, I mean, look, 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 look. They haven't done anything. To my knowledge, that I would actually really know about, and if they have, then they keep that shit on lock. But like, right. even then, like th there was different chapters of the clan. From what I recognize, there was a there was a first chapter, there was a second chapter in the 1920s, and I think I remember from what the research and like from what people I know have told me, like the second chapter, they rode harder than any anybody else. They marched on Washington because mm -hmm. I, I can't I don't remember what the exact thing they did was. Uh, what the president said, or whatever the bullshit happened. I'm not sure either. Like I'm, I got, I'm looking up the research behind it. That's why I was like, there's, there's some. I want to say some stuff about this. I'm just like, yeah. look, if if the clan can do something like this, why can't we do the same shit? Like, like they, they really like, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, yeah, yeah I mean, it's it's really interesting. I mean, uh, the text, uh, in the text, Lorenzo, I'm like calling him Lorenzo. I feel like that's weird. It sounds like an Italian man or something. But um, he brings up how a lot of people actually de-emphasize the importance or the relevance of groups like the Klan and Nazis and other fascist groups. And the text almost feels prophetic in many places, but in this passage especially, when he says that the Klan and Nazis have enormous growth potential. And I think that that's something we've really witnessed in the past four years especially. How, I mean, the entire presidency of Trump and his administration, it's like this incredible mobilization around racist ideology. I mean, much of his campaign was about shutting out Mexican immigrants and you know he's always rallying his supporters around this or that uh, racist thing he's doing whether it's just calling out random black newscasters and NFL players but um, in this text uh, Lorenzo says that people do underestimate the power that these groups have, you know, and he calls for the banning of them, which is interesting, especially from a question of 
what grounds these w these groups would be banned on because I don't think he w he would be someone who campaigns for a thing like you know don't allow them to have a thing like free speech or something you know I think that's how we all or many of us sort of mentally approach groups like the Klan right now like who are they except for guys that get together and talk about how racist they are you know like I don't know what they do beyond this I know that they do organize and do do certain things but I think they're there, a lot of the things that they do as far as action goes are relatively unknown to the general public. I don't know what kinds of things they do do, you know. So it's interesting, but also what you just said about how if we all band together to fight racism, I think that, you know, this is true too. And I think that this is why this moment in time for myself is making me feel like, okay, I really need to understand, like, political theory right now we should all be trying to understand political theory to the best of our ability not because it wasn't relevant before but because i think it has never been so obvious at least to people in our general age range that there actually can be this mass social mobilization around efforts to resist racism and police brutality you know and i think some of that is because of what's happening with the pandemic. I mean, the fact that people don't have to go to work, now people have time to go out and protest and people have time to be reading and trying to be proactive and whatever. And I think that this is definitely a moment to be seized, you know, so I think you're right. And something he also says in the text is that the Black Liberation Movement needs allies, you know, and I think that's another reason that this moment in time is really standing out to people and it seems new that there's never been such a show of white support and there's never been protests that are this diverse it's usually majority black people protesting things like police brutality with a few scattered white people here and there you know it's really i don't think we've ever witnessed on this level so many white people showing out. And I think that this is a thing that is essential if we want to fight police brutality and systemic racism, you know? So yeah, I think, I think that what you just said is definitely true. For sure. Does any, yeah. Did, did you like this text? Have you read uh, this author before? I've never read him until this text. Uh, not quite. I've been uh, I've been reading a lot of Soul Yurik lately, as of as of like maybe a couple months ago. But like I'm I'm about to get into this. Like I'm sorry, I've been working like a lot <laughs> this past couple months. It's been crazy. Oh no, it's okay. Damn, you're still working. Yeah, <laughs> I do. I I work at a well shit. I was working at a do Dollar General. What's the name place? And then, um, I just got this job at FedEx, and shit, it's just like um, uh, it's 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 really it's bunch of nonsense it's like even the way the the people at fedex explain this is like well you know your grandma who like wasn't really into computers but now like her young kids are trying to show her how to order groceries online because she can't go out and get food and all that stuff it's all that type of stuff you know it's like there's yeah. a lot more orders it's just crazy out here yeah i was thinking about that too like older people accessing the internet and using it um that's that's got to be like a really steep learning curve um yeah oh wait people people are saying that they can't hear still can you guys hear or no <laughs> damn i'm sorry for these technical difficulties i can hear you you can hear okay it, um yeah le try leaving and coming back if you're having an issue especially since i adjusted the bit rate maybe your browser needs to adjust to the new settings so if you're having problems try that as well to disconnect and to reconnect Am I audible um, now, or am I still quiet? Yes, now you are audible. I'm back. Oh my god! Thank God. I was, I was gonna say, and was incapable of. I actually live, um, about twenty minutes from a county, that's basically populated and run by the KKK, and it's weird, because it's one of those things that like people know and just don't talk about, and it's very like, it's one of those things where it's like. I don't know, like my, like I accidentally, I was on a drive with my friends and we accidentally looked up and just realized like, oh my God, like where we were um, and had to find a way to turn around and stuff. Cause it, I mean, it, I, I think it's just really insidious. Like what's the how, county called? Um, I think it's, I think it was, I think it was Corbin. 
Um, I'm not Kentucky? sure. I'll have to double. Check. Yeah, it's it's something. It's something close to me, but it's weird because it's one of those things that people talk about, but like, I don't know. Like, it's not something that's talked about online, or it's not something that's like widely known. It's just one of those things that's like people hear, like you know it, and you just like nobody talks about it, and it's crazy how like insidious and deep and like these things run to the point that I mean, like there's whole counties that have this huge presence that just like it's just not reported on it's just not talked about except for when you look up and go oh shit we need to turn around you know um so when you say that it's run by the count or the the kkk runs it you mean that like all their elected officials and shit are kkk members i just mean like it's so overrun that it's like it's safer to assume someone's in than they aren't you know like it's just really like it's it's very heavily populated, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's it's just weird how like how these things are so like in plain sight, but still so underground, you know, just very insidious. Right. And I think it's also a failure of our legal system. And we're about to get into this. Uh, I really want to talk about things like the vagueness of law and stuff. I mean, we just saw Trump call for uh labeling antifa a domestic terrorist group you know but why is is the kkk seen as a domestic terrorist group i mean people defend they definitely them should be. I think yeah uh, who said like that within the past this is lex but i think oh. it was like maybe like a couple of years ago like recently not but they're allowed to organize and to march, so I feel like they're not labeled a terrorist group. They might be on like the yeah. FBI watch list, but the they fact that they're allowed to organize, they aren't you classified say? as one. They aren't classified as one. It's legal. funny that they say they're a terrorist group. One, they're not even a group. Two, they're like not radical at all. How is it radical to be not fascist? They're all just a bunch of soy boys, in my opinion. <laughs> Um, well, it's, yeah, it's interesting, because in this text, Lorenzo says that they should, we should ban the KKK and Nazis and all fascist groups, and I wonder how he thinks that such a thing could be achieved. I imagine by doing things like having them classified federally as a, a domestic terrorist group, which they absolutely fit the criteria for, but, you know, the language, the legal language around what even constitutes a terrorist group, period, is very vague. And our laws in general are very vague and open to interpretation. And as such, it's easy to see why groups like the KKK are allowed to persist with uh, not too much discussion about whether or not they function as a domestic terrorist group. Um, while other groups like Antifa now, people are discussing them as if they are a terrorist group because our law is just so vague at every level that, you know, everything becomes open to interpretation and it becomes open to interpretation through the lens of this racist-ass society we exist in. So what good is, is any law if they're all open to interpretation by a, a biased system, you know? Um, Fuck, I was just going to say something and I forgot. But let's let's get into this constitution reading of it. Um Cami has just appeared. Welcome Cami. Um well, well I was just saying, um sorry, my stomach was really hurting when we started and I don't know if I was like if I like made my points. I repeat myself often, sorry. But I think that this uh, that reading the constitution is so important and especially now i mean i don't know if you guys feel this way but in observing what a lot of people are posting and like you know especially uh, a lot of white people who are trying to make it known that they want to be seen as allies and this and that i'm seeing a lot of reposting like call this representative and say this script and call this representative say this script sign this petition do this do that you know and that's all well and good but i genuinely feel like a lot of the people calling for these kinds of actions don't even understand exactly what they're doing at any level really and it's like these actions i think are still useful 
But for all you know, you could be working against your own interests and against the interests of the black community if you don't understand exactly what kinds of things you're being proactive about, you know. So we need to all try our best to gain a comprehensive understanding of our legal system because this system is the foundation for for all uh, U.S. society, you know, and racism is absolutely baked into this system in a way that I feel is largely exclusionary. And this is part of why I think it's important to study all nation laws, uh, even as just examples of what works and what doesn't work and what is essential and what is not essential, especially if we're theorizing towards things like revolutionary overhauls of our current system, then we should be studying the failures of our particular system so as not to recreate them, you know. And on top of that, I mean, all radical approaches too, I think, will be useless if we don't have a solid fucking game plan we should have been prepared in my opinion we should have been better prepared or the white community should have been better prepared for this moment if we really want to be allies you know that when social mobilization around an issue like police brutality actually exists we already have a solid game plan for what we're going to do now instead of just protest and repost things on instagram like call this or that representative you know you need a solid game plan for correcting some of the failures of our legal system um, and so we need to look at this shape. And I think trying to also learn about the Constitution in, from a perspective where you try your best to be more neutral and removed from it, in the sense that try to look at it really as just a philosophy document to the best of your abilities and try to forget everything you know already about how the law is enforced and how the Constitution is enacted and realized in society. Because I think to, to try to remove context best you can mentally and actually look at how this fucking document is structured, then you begin to realize flaws that I think might not have been so obvious and also useful strategies to correcting certain things that might read as more uh, unimportant to other laws and the laws that more specifically or explicitly uh, enact racist agendas and stuff, we should be looking at all of these laws and thinking from a philosophical standpoint whether or not they're adequate into serving the goal, whatever the goal may be. And the goal of the U.S. Constitution is outlined in the preamble. So let's look at that first because it is the first fucking paragraph Shut up, smoke your cigarette. Does anyone have the text in front of them? Will they read it out loud so I can keep smoking my cigarette? Oh, what? Someone read the preamble out loud to oh. us, please. Cammie, can you do it for us? Uh, let me pull it up. Uh, where's the link at again? While she's pulling it up, for anybody who is... New. Oh, I got it's, it. Uh, oh, you got it? Great. I just want to say before we get into the Constitution that this is the ground zero of all U.S. legislation. It sounds like it might, it probably is obvious to a lot of people who have taken things like U.S. history courses in more recent memory, but as someone who can't even remember really learning U.S. law in school, I think we did it like a bit in like seventh grade. I wasn't even sure if the Constitution is the most foundational document or if there's anything like underlying it. Like, is there some sort of like preliminary text that the Constitution is founded on? No, the Constitution is the supreme law of the United States of America. It establishes the structure of government and also specific, specific mm, rights and statutes uh, the most baseline principles of law and it's really quite short and it's really quite amazing that a country as large as ours operates using this uh document which yeah is pretty short and vague and let's let's talk about it so tick can you read to us the preamble this is the first text in the constitution which is essentially the thesis of it i sure can um 
one second. Let me get my push to talk thing going. <laughs> okay. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish just ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. And that's it. <laughs> that's it. So that's you cut out a little it. bit. So let me let me just reread that first part. Let's look at this, okay? Let's imagine we are uh, teachers and our students have been tasked with creating a government. And this is their thesis sentence. Let's look at this fucking thing, okay? Because this is the core thesis of what our government exists to do. The language of this, okay? We the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union that clause right there is already alluding to something which is that the constitution exists to establish a federal government because after the revolutionary war you know the states wanted to come together and create a a, a centralized government that all the states would be beholden to this perfect union um establish justice which is interesting language um because so like it hasn't been established yet yes <laughs> and i feel like we're uh i feel like these are the kinds of things i mean the the language from a philosophical perspective i think is really is really treacherous because yes established justice insinuates that justice does not exist external to the u.s you know and this might seem arbitrary but it's definitely a, a core principle of u.s government specifically as it relates to things like foreign policy you know in all of these laws they speak only to or they establish, rather, that the supreme law of the United States is the thing that establishes justice. And so anything external to us is not inherently just, you know. And this is the justification for why we can do things like uh, terrorize the fucking world and do whatever we do to every other nation, you know, because we don't have any provisions against this in our very constitution it insinuates that we are the establishers of justice and everyone external to us may be participating in just activities but only if they're working in accordance with our best interests so i, I wouldn't i didn't necessarily interpret it that way i think how it's do you more interpret it establishing justice as separate from the british empire so creating a version of justice that is more in line with uh, how people would prefer not people but the states would prefer to operate outside of britain Right. No, I, I, I'm not suggesting that this is like explicitly like what like p they were trying to insinuate anything that I just said, only that, you know, when you actually examine the Constitution, these sorts of things uh, are not really since they're n they're kind of just created as givens this is how the whole system ends up functioning you know so it's not to suggest that they were like okay we're going to use this uh, language this way to center ourselves in all theories of moral justice or something and exclude everyone else only that you know at baseline these kinds of principles do end up manifesting in the way that i was just describing and how we deal with things like foreign policy and all this you know yeah, I just don't, I'm not sure if they had the foresight of it. Uh, right, I, I agree with you. I mean. think that, right, yeah, I'm, I'm not suggesting that this is intentional, you know, only that if you don't create a, a, a sound philosophy and have foresight, then of course you're going to run into all types of problems down the road. And now when the public 
has issues with how we treat other other uh, world nations and stuff, you know. There's really no justification in our own constitution for why any member of the United States should give a fuck and why Congress or anyone else should be beholden to some sort of moral standard for how we enact certain foreign policies, you know. This is why ha we have to do things like create international coalitions to set standards for acts of warfare and what is ethically acceptable and what is not and stuff because our government did not have the foresight or the or didn't care period about these kinds of things but these are the kinds of problems we're embroiled in you know so to examine the constitution as the most foundational principle of all u.s law like this kind of a thing i think easily becomes a problem especially since you know like we were just saying this all becomes open to interpretation but anyway let's continue um so we've just read the preamble so oh i just video ew no video i'm so ew okay i hope no one saw that anyway um so for those who don't know the constitution is seven articles and then 27 amendments um and these first three articles establish the three branches of U.S. government. The legislative branch, whose job it is to create laws. This is the branch of Congress. Congress, which has the House of Representatives and also the Senate. Then Article 2 establishes the uh, executive branch, which is the president and his peoples. And it is their job to enforce the law. He controls the military as well. And then the third branch of government, the judicial branch, wh whose job it is to interpret the law. And this is the Supreme Court and also other courts which can be created by Congress. And this structure is outlined in these first three articles. This is what they exist to do, to set up these three branches of government and also uh, to assign them their specific powers. And also, um, I linked that US crash, crash Course in History video series. I highly recommend it to anybody who needs uh, refreshers or just knowledge period about how this shit works. It's a good series, but watch it at 75% speed if you feel like the speaker is talking too quickly, which I, I did. So these are the first three articles. Um, and the philosophy inherent here is this idea of establishing a system of checks and balances to basically fracture legislative powers or, or powers of authority, legal authority, into these different groups and create a system where there's sort of this equilibrium established. At least that's the theoretical goal. Um, and this this is a this is a thing that exists for uh or it's a philosophical concept rather you know and what do you guys think about this concept it sounds like a obvious thing but do you guys agree with this kind of an approach to government let's pretend that we are the fucking forefathers or something do you think that there's utility in this kind of an approach? In a Senate and a House of Representatives? Yeah, well, in this, this idea that um, we should fracture authority or powers and assign them to various groups based on their kind of power so that we establish some sort of an equilibrium. No, I think it makes it too. Uh, um, well, I think there's there should be groups, but not as many as we have. Why? Why is that? It, it it just like the whole federal law versus state to state law. It just makes it too complicated, and there should well, I think this, this should just be federal law. Hmm. That's really interesting, Kami. 
Um, and I didn't say, for anybody who doesn't know this, every state also has three branches of government, these same oh. three branches, a legislative branch, a executive branch, and a judicial branch. So each state has its own constitution, its own Congress, its own uh, executive branch headed by the governor, who, you know, that would be analogous to the role of the president at the federal level, and then their own Supreme Court and all of the other courts that can be established by the state's respective legislative branch. And I think that what you just said is true uh, or can be true. There can be a compelling argument made that the more these kinds of powers and authorities are fractured, the more complicated it becomes to the average citizen and makes them further and further removed from from direct action to take to, you know, campaign for this or that law or their own personal interests. I think that's definitely true. Um, and it creates this sort of decentralization of power, which is interesting. It's something we talked about in Phenomenology Club the other day um, about how, you know, people always speak, especially I see it coming from a lot of people who call themselves socialists and stuff, they talk about how power should be decentralized as this sort of, it's almost treated as some sort of like a moral mantra, you know, and I think that this is probably true depending on the specific question we're asking, but I think like you just said too, you know, that maybe it would be better to strategize towards the federal government having more authority in certain instances because as we'll talk about in a second, we see in these the amendments in the Constitution that um, uh, that you know states are beholden to the federal government. They can't make unconstitutional laws. So if we want to fight a thing like police brutality, if we want to do a thing like Lorenzo was calling for in his text when he said that all killer cops must be prosecuted. We can try to establish this on a state by state level, but why wouldn't we want to do that at the federal level, in which case all states would be beholden to this. And I think also to think about these first three articles, what they're trying to do, and part of the reason that the legislative branch is separated into these two houses, the House of Representatives and the Senate, um, part of what they're trying to do is add and subtract weight in the sense of authority authoritative weight from certain parties and redistribute it in a way that creates some sort of theoretical equilibrium and i find that to be really interesting especially when thinking about questions like racism you know because we talk about democracy this is what the u.s is supposed to be a democracy you know and a lot of what goes into the constitution is is efforts uh, made to try to take some weight off of this thing and add some here and you know this state is smaller so they'll get more representatives in the house so that they count as being equal and shit you know these kinds of principles are integral to the u.s government so but this is also the problem we run into when we don't have where where certain racial minorities don't have equal voting power you know like these kinds of principles are integral to the constitution so maybe something people should strategize towards if we're going to talk about things like racism is assigning more voting power to the black population and other racial minority populations you know things like this and the concept of democracy is kind of troubled from the very beginning like what is true democracy and when does a group when should a group a minority group uh be given extra power such as is being established in these first three articles where we're trying to create branches of government that are more equally weighted even though they're they are weighted differently the legislative branch of congress is the most powerful and this is why it's fractured into two groups to redistribute this power and then the executive branch and then the judicial branch has the least uh power but they all interact with each other you know um 
So I think that this is really interesting, thinking about the philosophy of democracy itself, you know. Do you, do any of you feel, do you, what, what are your takes on democracy? Do you align with democratic ideals or do you feel that it's too problematic for some of these reasons? I don't even think, you know, most people don't even, there, I don't think there's a true democracy in the entire world. It's all representative based. So, yeah, that's mm -hmm. like, I feel like I like the idea of democracy in concept, but I feel like on such a wide scale, it's kind of hard to have it function in a way. I don't know. It, it, I feel like it's just kind of harder to execute than it is in theory. And it's like, I think it's especially hard to execute when there's so many divisions of law within the state. It's almost impossible. So I wouldn't say the U.S. is like a democracy at all. Um, what do you guys think? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Can Can someone please define like what a Republican would be? Oh yeah. So what is the difference between a republic and a democracy? Let me pull up the official answer so that I don't uh, butcher my my words. Because the the U.S. is both a republic and a democracy. Right, so let's see the official answer. Republic is a state in which supreme power is held by the people and their elected representatives. Okay, democracy, a system of government by the whole population or all the eligible members of a state, typically through elected representatives. So, I think that the key difference between this two is only the framing, really. I think that democracy simply has a stronger emphasis on ideas of representational power, you know. And I think republics, although they also use things like uh, representatives to represent people, um, I, th I think that the main difference would only be that they have less of an emphasis on this idea. Um, can anyone else speak to this? I think that there's a problem with a democracy in general because there seems to be a big like elitist kind of circle of the same families like entering as like high higher up officials in like the Senate and such. Like, we see the same, like, presidents and their sons and stuff becoming the president again. And it, it kind of seems like no matter what we vote for, there's always going to be this inner circle. Right. And this is kind of the problem with pure democracy, period, right? That uh, the majority will always rule. And even if we're just talking about things like what you're talking about, nepotism and shit, you know, and continued legacies, this kind of a thing will also persist if you just have democracy that, it, that does something like pure one-to-one -one representation, you know. There's mm -hmm. all types of ways where you can establish some sort of a stronghold in a democratic system so that you maintain your power, uh, even if people are voting in a way where their vote is, uh, every vote is equally counted or something, you know. I think that this kind of yin yang of democracy versus republican uh, republic is also apparent in other ways that our government is structured. For one, uh, before I forget which amendment it was, I think it's the 17th amendment, but before this amendment, um, senators were actually not even elected officials. They were people who were already um, sort of. Uh, uh, chosen by other legislatures. Yeah, there were people who already held positions of power in the state, and I think that certain state officials would come together to choose their senators. They, they weren't elected by the people. And part of the reason this is, I learned from the PBS crash course, again, you should all watch it, I linked it, is because the Senate is supposed to be more serious and more kind of prestigious and work more as trustees 
of their respective states in the sense that sometimes they can act in a way where they might know what is best for the people even if this might conflict with what the people think they want. And this idea, this philosophy is actually baked into how the Senate is structured. This is why senators, uh, I think, had a higher minimum age requirement, and we still see this today. Senators tend to be older. They have longer terms. All of these things we're familiar with, but I think we're not often enough exposed to the reasons why this is so it almost seems kind of like silly or religious when you look at it like oh the senate they, they really thought that the senate would be wiser individuals they're sort of they're supposed to be like your wiser older grandparents that know what's better for you you know and i think this kind of idea is more represented by uh by republicans you know and ideas of republic that yes it is representational but there's and and it's expected to fulfill the desires of the people but there's also these sort of baked in ideas that age uh will give you wisdom and you know our elected officials can sometimes have more power than what people might be comfortable giving them you know and then uh instead of having six-year terms and an older minimum age requirement, the Congress, I'm not the Congress, I'm sorry, the House of Representatives, the other half of Congress, this is the more democratic house within this uh, bicameral legislative branch, these two sections. The House of Representatives is much more democratic. They have shorter terms. They have a maximum of two years. Uh, for the terms that they can serve in the House of Representatives because the idea is that, you know, you want the House representatives to always be uh, reflecting the needs of the people. And so if we're unhappy with any of our House representatives, we can just vote them out as soon as they come in, you know. Two years is a long time, but it really kind of isn't, you know. So we can just cycle them out pretty quickly. They also have a younger minimum age requirement. I think I said that. Um, and also, for anybody who doesn't know, the House of Representatives is also more, uh, it represents your populace. So larger states have more House Representatives, and smaller states have less. Uh, so it's based on your population, and the minimum you can have is one. There is no state that has zero uh, House Representatives. Um, and so this is actually why it's structured this way. It was, it's, a, it's a really conceptual kind of approach to trying to create this much more democratic entity, the House of Representatives, that is at all times representing the needs of the people versus this older sort of wiser group where there's equal representation for each state. Each state has two senators. So at all times there's uh, 100 senators in the Senate and it's supposed to be this older, more distinguished group with longer terms that can sometimes act in ways that they think is best, even if this doesn't reflect the direct needs of the people. Sorry to rant. Um, any thoughts on this before we move on? Thinking, um, or kind of like the uh, representation of, you know, tribal governance and sovereignty within those like indigenous tribes and how they were uh represented in this whole you know first part of the section until they talk about you know the uh, free persons and kind of like indians not taxed and then the three-fifths of all persons and kind of like how you know native americans too especially passed the 14th amendment it didn't apply to them until like i think the 20s ship act it was in 1920 something oh okay interesting oh yeah yeah sorry to skip over that i forgot that this is also in there i'm glad that you brought this up because this is incredibly important in Article 1, Section 2, this article that establishes the legislative branch, it also mentions that this excludes Indians, like you just said, and uh, the justification for this is that they are untaxed. Um, 
and also that uh for all slaves they would count as three-fifths of a person and this represents a compromise because the southern states wanted more representation and so they wanted their slaves to count as people just as other non-voting parties also counted as people that uh would help your state have more representatives because you know women also couldn't vote but they still counted as people and this was reflected in the house of representatives how many house representatives you can get you know and northern states didn't want slaves to count as people because then they would have less representation or they felt that the south didn't deserve this representational power for their slaves so this is the compromise they came into three-fifths of a fucking person it's like just a little over half a person and i don't know the that there had half- a lot of power and during that time because of that, you know fifths of a person because slavery was so heavily the south that they just had more control of you know part of the government right that population that they had at the time right because yeah i mean they had so many slaves that even counting them as three-fifths of a person starts to really add up you know and also, I imagine incentivize getting more slaves because the more slaves you get, the more uh, voting power and representational power you also get. Because even though they don't count as full people, they still count as people, you know. It's um, incredibly fucked. Um, something else, too, in here. They talk also in each uh, of these first three articles, establishing the three branches, they um, talk about, or each one contains um, a clause about how these positions are all paid, and they're all paid out by the U.S. Treasury. And this, I think, is interesting, that this, principle of paying our elected officials is written into the constitution at this foundational level um for many reasons for one it it kind of establishes capitalism i feel like as well it's kind of uncapitalist in a certain way uh because you know, capitalism is, what's the official definition? Capitalism is when private, hold on, I'll look up the official definition. Capitalism, an economic and political system in which a country's trade and industry are controlled by private owners for profit rather than by the state. And it's interesting because, you know, the U.S. is undoubtedly a capitalist society, but at a certain level, well at the constitutional level there's so many laws relating to our economics the payment of our elected officials the federal government controls commerce and uh taxation you know so the government really the constitution really establishes a lot of economic power to the federal government and this is something we should be thinking about as well you know especially since social mobility in the united states of america is a thing that is mostly enacted by capitalist means so in addition to paying attention to what kinds of laws are being established as they relate to you know general law and order and structures of ethics and all this shit uh it's also important to be thinking about what kinds of economic principles they're establishing here because i think this also becomes a problem too when it comes to theorizing towards solutions to any problem in america um i'm just looking at my notes Mm. Oh yeah, Article 1, Section 9, this is relevant to what's going on. The privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. 
I think that this is something we should be aware of. This is Article 1, Section 9, that Congress has the right to overthrow habeas corpus in instances of rebellion. And that's crazy because they don't even say, like, what is rebellion, you know? We're already starting to see the vagary of this language that creates a, a lot of easy ways to abuse legal powers. Um, we'll come back to that. Okay, so the first three articles establish the, the three branches of government. Right, right, right. Let's continue. Article 4 uh, basically just establishes cooperation between the states. Um, you know, the idea that states will all respect each other's respective uh, laws. So if, for instance, somebody murders somebody in New Jersey, flees to Connecticut, Connecticut will turn that person back to New Jersey so that New Jersey can prosecute them according to their own state laws. Things like this. Uh, Article 4 also establishes that states cannot join together and create new states. Um, this is unconstitutional. Um, and also cannot create states within states. So New Jersey can't make a little New Jersey inside of it and say this is the little New Jersey state like this. Um, Article 5. But what, uh, sorry to interrupt, um, yes. but what about the city-states, like D.C.? I, I feel like uh, I read somewhere that New York City is a city-state in, in terms of the banks. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but the District of Columbia is not a state. They are a, a federal zone, so they're governed by the federal government alone. They don't have a state government. It's a federal district. And this is why, you know, we just saw Trump be able to just bring the military right to D.C. Because they're not beholden to things like states having to grant express permission to the executive branch and to the president if he wants to send troops in, you know. This is why, uh, I think this is why, I don't know, this is all anecdotal. I'm definitely not a legal expert. I think this is the first time I've read the Constitution from start to finish. But I think, in my anecdotal experience, that what Trump has been trying to do amidst all these protests is actually finding the legal loophole for how he can send in military troops to states without states granting him that express permission. Because unless they grant this permission, this is unconstitutional. The states have to give the president the authority and the permission to send in military troops. So I think this is why he was trying to do things like classify Antifa as a terrorist organization, because if you can prove, or he doesn't have to prove it, but if you can establish that Antifa is a terrorist organization, then, that, then a federal crime is being committed. And if a federal crime is being committed, this is a mechanism by which the president can override the state's uh, right to have permission for sending in the troops. He can send them in without their permission. You know, and also I think why they're talking so much about interstate travel, because the gov the federal government controls state relationships and interstate of crimes and things like this. So the, I think that's why there's been such an emphasis from Trump and his people on interstate travel. They were trying to say, like, 80 percent of the protesters in Detroit came from outside the state and shit trying to make it seem like federal crimes are being committed because people are crossing state lines to incite riots and shit. Were you just going to say something, Kami? Uh, that's, a, that's a lot. Like, I can... From, from the perspective of someone uh, who kind of understands... Like, not, not necessarily too much about military or, like, even Detroit, like, just, just off those two topics in themselves. Like, I was in Michigan yeah. for two years... Um, I I can understand why uh, I can understand why Trump would send people like the Coast Guard. That's like that really is sending like the Coast Guard isn't necessarily the military. It's like that's like that's they're they're military, but they aren't necessarily military. They just protect the nation. Like if there's mm. people who've been stationed on Coast Guard their whole lives, and like if someone to attack here, then like they're they're the military that like has to help us over here. So like sending them in on people over here is like sending in people like who are like beasts of like. They send them on people who are like beasts of no nation. So it's like they're sending them on like 
people like us who just like basically like send them on anarch anarchists basically in, in in the basic sense of the word like even then with uh michigan i can say this much um I, I saw a lot of stuff that was going on and a lot of the stuff that, I, that, that they tried to show that like a lot of the protests that went down in Michigan were peaceful but Michigan has gone through a lot like there was a flood that happened in Michigan and I was so happy I, I gave five thousand dollars to my family so that they could get out of Michigan like maybe five or six months beforehand so they, they're like they're doing fine they're like really uh they're just really doing fine like wherever the fuck they are <laughs> But yeah. Wait, from flooding, you said? Yeah, there was a flood in Michigan. Uh, it really wasn't far from where they were staying at. Like, they were in Ann Arbor. They aren't there no more. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, damn, you hear of this. Dude, yeah. It's fucking crazy. Wow. This is the first time hearing of that. That's crazy. I'm glad your family's okay. Yeah. But, so. I mean, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no. I was, because I was, you were saying, um, that the the military does come they're known to like go into states when certain natural disasters happen and shit you know and i think that historically the states grant this permission but i honestly don't even understand and i need to understand exactly what things like the national guard or what what standards they're beholden to because this is something i've learned recently and trying to learn about this shit as fast as possible and not digesting it all right away but the national guard from what i understand is a part of the military but they are they answer to their respective states but they can become quote unquote activated as a federal army as well or be, have to answer to the federal government in certain instances and then they're just a part of the military i don't really understand like, look, it look. seems like they operate within two binary modes all of them have to like all of them have to answer under like the federal they have to answer under the president all of them have to do that but the national right. guard is like they're strictly here for us like you can there's going to be people who people in the National Guard, like some of them, like some of them can go and like go into the military if they wanted to. It, it's not really necessarily it's, it's really of their own volition, but a lot of them will choose to like stay here and like protect here in case anything happens. OK, that's interesting. Like I didn't even know that night in a sense. Yeah, <laughs> I choose to go on a mission. Send me. Choose me. Okay, that's really interesting. It's like yeah. how we send the it's like how we send the army out. The army is like like you have the army, then you have the navy, then you have the marines. And like those are three very powerful like groups in in the military like like if you if you have like the 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 navy, like the navy will be there first and then they'll send the the marines out to be on the land, but the navy's still going to be in the ocean and the marines and the army they're gonna be both out there because like they're built for that shit and now we got space force so we got all grounds covered yeah for sure <laughs> can't wait for space <laughs> warfare that's gonna be great <laughs> um yeah yeah i i uh the national guard i need to i need to understand uh more about how this works if anyone else uh can explain to us too um i don't i don't entirely understand um so this is this is stuff that's not necessarily established in the constitution either um and we could talk more about that let's let's continue through this real quick we talked about article 4 which establishes cooperation between the states um and things like laws against the forming of or two states trying to merge or something like this um article 5 establishes congress's right to make amendments to the constitution and how they can do this so you know article 5 basically establishes this right for the congress to amend the law and add amendments of uh, which we're about to get into um Article 6 
uh, says that the Constitution is the absolute law of the land and all judges must abide and be beholden to this law um, despite individual states' laws. So this basically establishes the idea that states ultimately will be beholden to the federal government even though states are allowed to do things like create their own laws. These laws must be in accordance, in accordance with the federal government and the precedence it establishes. And then Article 7 is basically just kind of a postscript um, that says, you know, this will be sufficient for the ruling of the land. It's basically like, so let it be written, or so shall it be written, so shall it be done. It kind of just functions this way. It's just sort of a nice little stamp on the whole thing. So these seven articles, the Articles of the Constitution, this basically lays out the entire structure of government. It's the outline for how U.S. government performs, both to the establishment of these three branches and all of their respective duties, but also creates a guideline for how we can do things like amend the law and who holds that right, and um, also the state's individual relationships to this federal government. So this is what the articles do. Do we have any preliminary critiques or rather i'll ask what do you guys think are some pros and also some cons because we're not just looking well we're not just looking for failures but but do you think that any of these core principles of u.s government are useful and good things that would be essential to really any government what what do you guys think are maybe some structural things that you admire about this structure or think are useful and also, are any flaws becoming immediately apparent to you before we move on to the amendments? Tick, I'm calling on you. No? Lex, <laughs> I'm calling on you. <laughs> God damn it. Cammy. Right. Wait, I'll go. Lex, I'll go. Lex, you go. Um, I guess, um, for cons, kind of what we were talking about before, like, the representation, population, in theory, if we were a true democracy, I think that would be a pro, if we did include, you know, everyone that could vote, and, I mean, going later into the, con or the Constitution, talking about, you know, voter suppression, that type of shit, and who can vote, if that was different, then I mean, it'd be a pro. But I also think the president has too much power with um, militia and the military, in my opinion. And what, what, why do you feel that that way? Like, I mean, it's, I it's apparent that he does. But if you were trying to think of it like, like, do you think that the men who wrote this document, uh, because, you know, they were clearly preoccupied with things like making sure he didn't have too much power. If you were hypothetically one of these men, do you think that you would be feeling cautious already in this assignation of power? Or do you think that it, it, it's not apparent yet? Like, do you feel like they lacked foresight? I think they lacked foresight completely. Like, I, I believe that they only thought that they were going to fight the revolution at the time from the British, but didn't consider, you know, the people that they already have here that are fighting for representation within their own government that they're trying to create at the time. Mm. That's interesting. Because, yeah, I mean, that this would reflect already some structural problems, some cracks in the foundation. Um, a lot of this, like, the branches of government, like we were talking before, they each have checks and balances within themselves. But the president having just complete control of the military kind of seems like there is no check of balance towards the president and within like think about like i was thinking about while reading this earlier about impeachment and you know what would what would america look like 
if Donald Trump was impeached when he was being tried, and it would, I don't think it would change, to be quite honest. Because the vice president would just occupy his role and everything would just continue yeah, with a whole, different was, spokesperson. Yeah, exactly. It's, I think he's even worse. I think Pence is even worse than that on Trump. So it's like, you know, the whole cabinet probably is thinking along the same lines. So it's like, would you, wouldn't you want to throw the whole, throw it, throw it all away and just start again? Like, I don't know. <laughs> that's I think that's a great point because what you're saying I think it's totally true that the way it's structured where you know Congress has the right to impeach but still I mean what good is impeachment if the president also elects all of his immediate uh all of the people immediately under him he elects so many uh executive officials he ex he elects supreme court nominees you know like he has he has so much representational power, really. I mean, he's able to, as soon as he enters office, you know, uh, hire all of these people that represent his interests and stuff. So I think the a uh, 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 glaring philosophical flaw in this structure is that it presupposes that in the event of a president needing to be impeached, it would be because of some sort of hyper individualistic flaw, you know, this guy is just corrupted. And you know, he is this sort of solitary unit. And if you remove him, then it's fine, you know, but it doesn't, it does lack foresight, I think, in the way that you're describing that it doesn't account for the idea that the president is also going to have people that are acting in his interest around him so i think that that's absolutely a great point i also think at like a lower level too we we have the power to tell the house of representatives sort of our opinions on laws that are being formed but the senate essentially has the power to strong arm any decision at any given time they want right and we're we're noticing uh that in this administration especially it's like the house is basically good for nothing I, like they can't do anything because the senate is just opposed to them like at every level you know and to speak of that especially i mean this is partially realized by the fact that the senate has each state has equal representation and this is something that I feel like in the past four years, especially people are speaking out against more and more. Like, what is the point of, of states' rights, you know? It's integral to the United States of America, and it kind of makes sense when you consider when this was written. I don't know exactly how many states there were, but it wasn't as many states as we have now, you know? And each state kind of wanted to do their own thing. And it makes sense, kind of like, okay, we'll have equal representation because these states are doing things that look more different from each other. You know, they were they were operating in all types of different ways. You had states that wanted to be more have more slaves and this and that and states that were doing all types of different things that could almost look like competing interests or something. So the federal government kind of unites all of this. But, you know, nowadays it's like. We want democracy on the basis of things like racial representation and shit. Like, it seems much more important to your immediate livelihood what racial demographic you're a part of more than what state you're a part of, you know? Like, really makes, things like this. The whole structure from the get-go makes the whole state's ops power obsolete. What do you mean by that, Kimmy? Because of how much po power the president has, he just elects these people around him to basically watch his back in case anything happens to him and they're the ones that make all the decisions mm. well, i think we have more power like i mean we were talking before about you know just like a federal government but i think states like if you compare like a population of like you know european countries that have like fucking a couple thousand people or some shit like that and then you look at like Rhode Island compared to Texas, and it's like, what the fuck is that? You like, yeah, what? A lot of fucking people. That's an interesting question. I mean, what what do you guys feel like? Do you think that states should have more power, maybe, and we should be moving away from 
from trying to take more federal approaches to things like establishing standards of rights and stuff and focus more on states' rights. Because like, like Lex just said, I think that's a really good point that populations, you know, the difference in populations will make uh people will have totally different interests and also i think it'd be easier to manage you know part of the difficulty in managing the united states is just how fucking massive it is if we had it so that states came to more resemble their own respective countries then maybe that would actually be a good thing i mean it would be a terrible thing for all the people living in all the shitty states which is most of the states but maybe they could fucking leave and we could just let them squalor I think the states, if they had their, like, individual governments, that would, that actually, that would make more sense, because it would, and it would give the people more power, because it would protect us from a crazy president. Mm. I mean, usually, too, like, for the most part, like, think about how I mean, here in Wisconsin, I feel like it's more of a swing state, but you have super Republican states and you have super states. So it's like a lot of the the same people or most of the population is thinking in a certain political spectrum that, you know, they can represent themselves in a certain way compared to, you know, as a whole, you know, a lot of people are getting fucked because they don't agree with the terms that they're being given. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. kind of choose yeah. their location of living based upon their beliefs anyway like you know like the climate of the like social whatever like i think we should be more like europe in a sense like you know if you know if i wanted to if every state was a country and i wanted to move from wisconsin to florida you know, I can, like, I have citizenship within, like, Europe, and I can go wherever, you know, I mean, it's the same in the States, too, but it's, like, the representation there is so much different. What, what do you guys think, too, about the question, I didn't realize how long we've been going, sorry, I don't want people to, like, leave, we, we probably won't be able to go through all of this, but I think that we can start to widen our context a little bit and think about like do you guys think that this system even represents something that is just like thought above out of nothing and it would be like something you would come up with if you had a clean slate or is the structure of our government more of a thing that represents like already problems from the beginning because this is how it kind of looks to me as if like the whole system of checks and balances and all of these things with the states and shit it kind of seems like it's just seeking to manage a pre-existing set of conditions rather than it is to actually create like the strongest governmental philosophy you know like the states already existed they already had a revolutionary war like there were all of these factors already in place and now the federal government is is coming together to govern them as some sort of centralized power you know is this even a strong format period or is it a format that we were kind of forced to take because of all these existing variables kind of looks like we don't want to be britain so we're going to make sure we never become britain again Mm. like maybe they did consider us rebelling against them maybe that is what they mean in cases of rebellion well Hmm. Well, I feel like that's interesting because, you know, they're trying, they or they purport to be trying to create a government where a thing like tyranny becomes not easily established, you know, so then why do they just throw in these laws like, uh, or, the, or these clauses like, oh, and in case there's a rebellion, you could send in the military. Like, that seems counter to the whole philosophy that they're saying they're trying to establish, right? But they also give us, you know, the Second Amendment to utilize in the case of an actual tyrannical government coming into being. The Second Amendment, which is grammatically incorrect. Did you guys notice that? I've never noticed that. What does it say now. word for word? I'll read it. It's 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 a run it's not a complete sentence. It's so frustrating. I also posted a link to a discussion about this. 
Um, okay, I'll read it. You ready? Let's get into the amendments. But actually, let, let's start in order because it's only the second amendment. Let's look at the first one real quick. Like I said, this is going on for a while. We can keep talking. I have nowhere to go. I want to keep going. But I also want to make sure that we open up at a certain point and bring it back to this question of police brutality and racism because this is why we're here, you know, to strategize towards theoretical outcomes as it relates to this specific issue because the time is fucking now when we have all this social mobilization around this issue. So I don't want to just focus on the these, these more uh, disconnected conversations. We want to zoom it into something. But let's quickly just talk about these, some of these, uh, these amendments. Um, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, everything that we just read, these articles, this is the Constitution, and it's ratified in, uh, I believe, 1787. And then, or, yeah, seven, 1787. Then two years later, they come together with these first 12 amendments, or, mm, don't quote me on that, but it's no more than 12. And the first 10 of these amendments are the Bill of Rights. These basically outline rights of individuals um, as established by the federal government that all states will be beholden to. Um, so this first amendment is that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of or prohibiting free exercise of religion. It also uh, says that Congress cannot make no law abridging freedom of speech or of the press. Um, also, the right to peace, peaceably assemble um, and to petition government for a redress of grievances, which in simpler language is basically the right to raise problems and complain about how the law is operate, operating without being penalized. So speaking out against the government is not a crime. This is your right, you know, to talk about how the government is failing or not working how you wish it to. Um, so there's a lot packed into this very first amendment. You would think that these would all be separate amendments, but it's basically like a fucking, there's so many all in one. This right to uh, religion, free exercise of religion, and also the government can't uh, make a law respecting religion, which is also really interesting because we only really hear about the right to religion framed this way, that you have the right to freedom of religion, but we don't really talk about the fact that Congress also cannot make any law respecting an establishment of religion, which I'm not sure if that's something that they really enforce well. Um, there, there freedom of speech. Case uh involving in like the late 1800s or something where a mormon man wanted to establish his right to like have a polygamous marriage and the government's <laughs> argument was like if we let you do that then we let any individual person supersede the law of the land with their religion so yeah they basically were like no <laughs> you can't fucking polygamy <laughs> is not legal <laughs> Right, yeah, you can't make any law respecting uh, establishment of religion. But then isn't it so interesting that aren't, aren't churches untaxed? Isn't that uh, yeah. respecting there's, an establishment of religion? What is that? I don't know, like, the 501c3 clause is fucking bullshit. That's considered, like, a charitable what, organization. Like, the same thing that nonprofits are. Like, you can file for tax exempt status and it's corrupt as fuck and then what it's is, literally that? that's literally the loophole that, that it's reason why there's so many cults in america <laughs> Wait, but, but lex what was what was the the specific thing that you just cited so it's 501c3 tax exempt status it's what you i don't know i'm sure churches have to file it but like when nonprofits file for tax exemption that's the Form you fill out is a 501c3. Okay. 501c3. Yes. I don't like, do that once. CI and bullshit like that. What did and you, you just say? Say uh, that again. Hello? Uh, like, this is, look, this is kind of like a conspiracy theorist, like, leftist shit, but, like, I feel like churches pay the FBI, like, from my fucking knowledge. It's, it's like, I fucking. This is what I, I kind of believe. Like, oh, I, I'll, no. I'll, I'll never go to churches, like, ever again. <laughs> Wait, what's the conspiracy? 
that churches pay the FBI? Basically, basically. For what? Uh, well, I Just I filed for an uh, organization to be a church once, and I know nothing about the FBI. <laughs> well, I mean, there's like slick shit you can get into, like when they accept donations and shit like that. Like, there's people that will open up nonprofit businesses and give themselves donations so they won't have to claim it. Shit like that. It's fucked up. Yeah. Well, I want to hear. Wait, Torn, real quick. What What is the idea that the um, churches are paying the FBI for? I mean, like, it might it might sound weird just to say this type of shit, but like, you can say that all the donations necessarily go back into like, just like food for like the homeless, or like uh, paying someone's rent, or like people who are just like down and out and like really need the money. But then you look at, like, uh, people who, like, buy million-dollar cars and, like, houses that they really fucking want or, like, just a bunch of bullshit. And, like, how, 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 how do they make that money off their followers, right? So, right. I mean, like, the evangelic or whatever the fuck those, it literally those makes, mega churches. It literally allows people who want to make money off of desperate people. And that's how. That's why there's like there's like so many cults in America, and just like profiting off of desperate people who want. Damn. Nothing. What's that oh. one water called? That one fucking water. Whatever. That's like fucking expensive Easy to make money this way. It's crazy. Remember, Bethany, you were talking about some fucking water or some shit. Five hundred and twenty-eight kilohertz for structured water. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking, like, yeah. binaural beats, like, magic culture, where people believe that if you play 528 kilohertz, uh, if you put, literally, these people put headphones on glasses of water. That's how they, in they infuse the water with the vibes. <laughs> and that if you, like, do, like, mental affirmations while you're hitting the water with the headphones <laughs> with the 528 kilohertz, you can restructure your water to be anything you want, bruh. You can have like love, love light water. You can have like gay water. You can have whatever fucking restructure water you want. But what they believe is that the frequency actually changes the shape of the water molecules and restructures it. And then it takes on like this fucking structure. <laughs> and, then, and then you drink it and you gut those fucking vibes. Oh, let's not go into all that. Let's let's save that for later. I want to just go through these Bill of Rights quickly, and then we need to broaden the discussion and take it back to current events, because this is why we're fucking here. We need to get our theoretical thinking caps on and start to talk about these structural flaws, even the ones that don't seem like they relate exactly to racism. How are they all influencing each other and culminating in the United States of Triple K America. Okay, so we just read the First Amendment, which has a ton of fucking rights baked into it. Freedom of speech, right to religion, right to peaceably assemble, and to petition government uh, for a redress of grievances, aka your right to complain. Now, Amendment number two, the right to bear arms, which is an incomplete sentence and is grammatically incorrect. And I can't believe it. I'm going to read it to you real quick. Hold on. And I posted an article in the read-only chat, by the way, um, about this. <laughs> this is like, a, like legal experts talk about this, how this sentence is grammatically incorrect and what it means. And if the actual grammatical structure of this uh, poorly written amendment actually changes its meaning, it almost seems intentional because from uh, everything I was reading, everything was a perfectly functioning sentence up until this one. It's very suspicious. I wonder if there's a conspiracy around this. Okay, ready? You have to read it. Let me copy-paste it. You gotta see it, but I'll read it, too. Hold on. Copying, pasting right now into the chat. Look at this sentence. I'll read it out loud now. A well-regulated militia, comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. Like, what is this sentence? Are you looking at it? Look at this in the chat. 
this sen- I don't even get this sentence. Like, it sounds like they want the militia to just be the people within each state, just the civilians. So every anyone can well, be, like, start a militia. The thing that is contentious is that, because it would be grammatically correct without the right of the people to keep and bear arms. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state shall not be infringed. Maybe though that, that second set of commas should be like a, like a, a dash, like here, I mean, if it was like this. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security Is the right to keep and bear arms? Is that what they're saying? The right of the people to keep and bear arms is a well-regulated militia? (laughs) I hate this sentence. Like, what the fuck? Posted a link to earlier that the constitutional reporter one has a note beside it that says, since we need a National Guard to secure the country, citizens have the right to own firearms. That's how this person's translated it, which kind of sounds like it's saying that we are the militia ourselves, so to speak. Yeah, that's what this sentence implies, right? It says that a well-regulated militia is us, right? It's established by us keeping and keeping our own arms. So are they saying that the National Guard, which is the state's militia, would actually be the right? Because I think that's... Are you saying the link that I posted is what, what said? What you just uh, said? It's the one you told someone to repost in New Jersey earlier. Um, oh. I'll just copy-paste it right now. Okay, yeah. I think that was Tits Mike that had all the, like, um... That site was great. Okay, great. Oh. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, let's look at this. I'm number two. The translation of this amendment per this website, I'll post this in the main one to the read only chat so people can reference it. It's a really good resource. Thanks, uh, Tits Mike, for posting. That basically offers like a plain language translation of all amendments in law. So the translation they offer here is since we need a National Guard to secure the country, citizens have the right to own firearms. I think it's interesting that they, it says of a free state. So it's yeah. like, a state like that what has is this not, amendment? It's like a free state being a state that hasn't yet to be claimed. A free state being what? What the fuck is a free like? What does free state mean under the Constitution? What is a free state? Right. Like, is this some sort of like federalist idea? Like, does this have to do with states versus the federal government? A free. That's state? what I'm thinking of when I read this. I'm thinking of like, well, this is past like. 13 colonies bullshit but like a state like a free state by itself that's not a part of the united states or doing their own thing has the right to bear arms and have a well-regulated militia with the, or whatever that's how i'm interpreting it the first half of the sentence the run-on sentence but like, is the state consider as all states are all states considered a free state? Is it just like a certain state? I don't. That's what I'm confused on. I just googled like, the definition of free state, and it, the first one says historical. It says before the Civil War, a state of the U.S. in which slavery was illegal. Yeah, like well, yeah. the north northern state. Hmm. We we would have to consider like uh, the history of America, in my opinion, like how. Uh, I forget uh, the person's first name, but he was Guerrero. His last name was Guerrero. He was a black man. And it's kind of funny because uh, Speak, uh, he's a rapper. He he mentioned this a little a little while back in one of his tweets. And I was looking at that. I was like, man. <laughs> I was like, so th- there was a black man in Mexico who uh, he, uh, I'm trying to remember. He, he was basically like kind of in control of Mexico before like the Mexico that we have today. And like he he was taken down by a bunch of like Mexican nationalists, and they were able to just like control Mexico the way it is now. 
If you know Mexico the way it is now, it's just like it's still fucking wild. It's still fucking crazy. There's people who still talk about all the shit that goes on now. It's just fucking wild. And um, I mean, for I, a while, I, wasn't like Mexico, Arizona and most part of Mexico. Like, I, I I would definitely, in my opinion, I would still consider Mexico like a part of America because like I was I was <laughs> born here. Even though Mexico's Mexico and America's America, like. Mexico is still in the conversation. That's all we have Donald Trump talking about all the shit that he said. Thanks. I feel like a lot of how they exist is predicated on how we exist, you know. We've we've like ha- we've had such a hand in how they've been run and their government and our interactions with them and making them, you know, economically dependent on us in many ways and us also being dependent on them. For many industries, like, there's just a lot. Our relationship is so troubled, definitely. Cuba, too. Cuba, you said? Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, but not to spend too much time on this amendment, but I think that what Lex was just saying uh, fits with this translation that's also provided in that link that you posted. This idea that um, it seems to be saying that uh, the fact that states have their own national or the fact that the country has a military, that's the justification for why we have the right to own firearms. But I wonder, like, what, uh, I mean, the language here is so, so vague. And I noticed as I kept reading, I feel like all the amendments got more and more vague. I don't know if you guys felt this way. And it's really interesting because this kind of contrasts the the articles, which I felt to be much more rigorous. I mean, they have a lot of vague speech, too, but it seemed to be like, you know, orderly and like pretty meticulous. And there's a lot of attention to detail and stuff. And then the amendments just have this incredibly vague language. And all of this language is just left to be interpreted by the judicial branch, you know, this powerful entity that can interpret this stuff any which fucking way. I mean, look at public discourse, like, especially now. Look at things like Twitter and stuff. Like, you could take the same sentence and have a hundred interpretations of it, and people will fight themselves, fight amongst themselves until fucking exhaustion. It's not like this is a clear law. Like, who fucking, or amendment, who fucking knows what this shit means? It, It means whatever the people who are charged with interpreting the Constitution tells us it means. And I think that this is the most glaring structural flaw of the U.S. government, period. That the language is incredibly fucking vague. And this is why there's, there can be so many authoritarian abuses made so fucking easily, you know. And I think, I think a, a really big problem, too, is not only the vagueness of language, but the absence of justifications for a lot of these things. Because, I mean, any statement, period, is only as good as its underlying justification. So if you just create a law and don't explain why this law exists, which is actually the most important and integral principle to the formation of this law, then your law is really good for nothing. And it can be enacted in any which way, even in a way that contradicts the original meaning of it and why it exists, you know? So this is a problem, too. I mean, I feel like any comprehensive philosophy of government, if we're going to theorize towards better governments and shit, there should be literally like a fucking constitutional footnote. Like, you know, this is what we mean by this word. Have a constitutional dictionary. This is what we mean. Because even if they defined a thing like, you know, well, something we're about to get into, actually. Amendment number, what was it? An amendment four, I'm just going to skip over three real quick. Well, three is easy. I'll just say it real quick. No soldier shall be quarter- quartered without consent of the owner. A soldier can't be forced to stay with you or some shit. <laughs> um, amendment four, though, uses this word unreasonable uh, to talk about how the government cannot uh, commit and state governments cannot commit um, unreasonable searches and seizures uh, without a warrant. Um, and warrants can be granted, or warrants cannot be granted without probable cause. I mean, first of all, what does unreasonable mean? An unreasonable search? Like, what's unreasonable? Can we get a definition? There should be a footnote with what the fuck you mean by unreasonable. 
And secondly, what is probable cause? Because this is a thing, too, that's really relevant to what's going on right now. The conversation is what, what the fuck is a probable cause? If a, if a cop just has a fucking hunch that you might, he could just say, oh, I smell, your car smells like weed or something, you know. Call up the judge and get a warrant because your car smells like weed. Or you can just literally pull anything out of your ass to, to say that it's a probable cause. So how the fuck are we supposed to work with this vague as fuck language, you know? It's not a coincidence. Like, I think that there's definitely a utility to having vague language, depending on what the law is. But not for a thing like Amendment Number 4, which is that, you know, probable cause is enough to get a warrant. Like, what the fuck? You have to tell us what probable cause means, right? Is crazy. Um, let's just keep plowing through, and then I want to open up the conversation. And let's let's just go. I we need to talk about the now. So Amendment Number Five. This is basically I plead the fifth. You know, you have a right to not wit be a witness against yourself in a criminal trial. So you know, if you're asked like, did you do this on this day or whatever, you you can plead the fifth. It's almost like saying, yes, but I don't have to tell you that, you know. But you can also invoke this amendment where you feel like answering in a way might be harmful to you in a criminal trial. It also establishes the right to a grand jury and also um, the double jeopardy clause. You can't be tried twice for the same crime, which I think is a good law. That makes sense. Um, also, you cannot be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, which I think is a really interesting thing to put in here. Like, you can't be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. What were they thinking when they put this in here, you know? Like, light, what the fuck is... What does without due process mean? Without due process is like judicial? um through the through the courts yeah like yeah. you have a right to a trial and uh an official due process um anyway i'm i'm gonna keep continuing i don't want to get hung up on another one we can also talk more about this next time we meet too um amendment six right to a speedy trial makes sense makes sense amendment seven Right to trial by jury in civil suits over $20. So basically, you can, like, sue your neighbor if your neighbor fucking said he'd draw you a picture and he doesn't give it to you. Shit like this. Take on the Judge Judy. Amendment 8. Excessive, quote-unquote, bail shall not be required. Also, in quotes, excessive fines shall not be imposed uh, for criminal behavior. And... No cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. This, again, is like so... The, the vagueness of language here is incredibly vague. These things require definitions. What is cruel and unusual punishment? This is the kind of thing that makes, you know, like Guantanamo and shit controversial. Like, when, when does something cross the threshold of being cruel? One could easily argue that it's cruel to have to go to the American prison system, period. I mean, what is the percentage of rape? that we see people uh, experience in our prison systems, you know. Like, they are so poorly managed, and the guards are so abusive, police are so abusive, you know. Like, they, oh, why, how is this not cruel and unusual punishment, the way that all of these entities that are tasked with enforcing the law operate? Like, hello? But because That's this fake. is also open interpretation, they can just say, oh, it's not cruel or unusual, it was necessary. I had a reason for this, you know? Like, the whole thing with, like, solitary confinement and what a huge relied-upon quote-unquote punishment it is in the prison system, and there's people spending, like, three years in solitary over minor offenses, and that's, like, so textbook cruel and unusual punishment, and it just goes unchecked. Right, I feel like there's, like, sadists that work in the prison system. They're probably just oh, torturing absolutely. people for fucking fun. Like, oh, I don't like this guy. I'm going to throw him in solitary. Like, I don't like fuck the, with me. A good example of this is uh, when there was a black man who was arrested who he had a backpack that was his backpack. And I, I, I don't remember his name either, but, like, because there's so many people. There's so many black people who, who mm -hmm. like, been through this type of shit. And he was arrested but he didn't rob anybody. That was his backpack. And he spent three years in solitary confinement. Right. And he killed Insane. himself. 
or something oh like that. I'm, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure he killed himself. Or yeah, no, I just I'm talking. Yeah, he got out of prison and just couldn't. He just couldn't manage anymore because it had such a toll on his on his um his mental health. It's so brutal. Right. Like even just like a few days is enough to cause brain damage. It's just not enough. It like the, the prison system is it's like the the system that we have right now, like I, I want like honestly, I'm I'm a I'm a tell the truth. Like I've been through so many systems. I, I used to want to kill myself over bullshit. Like I used to want to do so much bullshit. Like I used to be a graffiti artist. I used to want to like fucking do a lot of bullshit, but like in the end, like when I found out how far it could take me as far as like how they put these pills in the systems of human beings. And I don't know what they do to people in solitary confinement, but like I I've never been through solitary confinement. I was in a, I was in a uh I wasn't I was in a suicide cell with like three different people. Like one of those people they tried to burn it was a it was a black kid. He tried it was in Georgia. It was in Georgia. And it was a black kid. And I know he wasn't that fucked up because he was so rem- he was so remorseful, so remorseful. You can probably find this article. It was probably like maybe I, I would say 2015, 2016. That's the best I can say. He tried to burn both of his parents in the house that he lived in around like maybe February or March. And there was a guy, there was, there was a white man. He was really old. And he got into an argument with someone at a bar, and he was there for like just fighting. And there was a uh, there was a black man. He was he was in the same he was in the cell. Hey, you cut out. Cut out. Shit. Went. Someone at him in the chat and told him that he just cut out. But yeah, this this is all so relevant. I mean, there's no, there's there's really like, who are these institutions beholden to? Um. Yeah, can he see that he's cut out? It says he's green too, which is so strange. I know he had Wi-Fi problems before, but before he comes back and let's let's center the discussion around this kind of a thing now. Um, let's just read the last two amendments because this is the complete Bill of Rights and then we should talk about how this all enforces these systems that we're starting to talk about, our prison systems, our police systems. So Amendment 9 is kind of strange actually and um, it basically is some, it's linked to Amendment 14. It kind of says, what is the language of it real quick? Uh, it basically t- uh, talks about how there's kind of these implied rights. Um, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. And these other rights are not specified. So there is this implied, there are these implied rights that this amendment is basically saying um, citizens reserve. Um, oh, we'll talk about that later. That's not entirely important right now. And Amendment 10, this is the last in the Bill of Rights. The powers not granted or prohibited by the Constitution are reserved by the states. And this is important to everything we're discussing, too, you know, that if there is no explicit law uh, creating some sort of mandate for what a state can or cannot do, then the states reserve the rights to create their own laws and enforce them. So these are the Bill of Rights, and I think that we should stop our constitutional analysis conversation here for now. I think we could continue it next time. I want to meet next week, and we'll also read another text by another black thinker. Um, But uh, let's talk about the now. How are all of these ideas, the, the structure, how are we starting to see the structures of U.S. government and our legal system itself? allow for things like what we're witnessing with uh, racism and police brutality. How do you think that the system allows these things to propagate? Like, give some examples of the structural design flaws you see here and how they're they're manifesting. Cami. Shit. 
What uh, what amendment did we get up to? Ten. We just did the Bill of Rights. I mean, we could talk about what we're just talk what what Torn was just talking about before he cut out. Did he answer you in the chat, by the way? Um, Not yet. I don't think. Not okay. Yet. He said his Wi-Fi was acting up, so that's probably what happened. But um. We're, we're starting to see more and more conversation right now about things like police abolition and uh, prison abolition, things like this. You know, they're conversations that have been ongoing for a long time, especially in the black community. But you're starting to see actually white people support these kinds of ideas. And this is sort of a new historical movement, at least to the extent that we're seeing. Um, I think that's something that's important for a lot of people to realize that maybe they haven't is that when people talk about things like police and prison abolition what they're not calling for is is the total ab ab abolition of a thing like the use of force physical force to enforce laws such as laws against murder laws against rape you know they're they're not suggesting that the thing that a lot of people think the police exist to do uh, which is to protect and serve, they're saying that this is not actually what they exist to do, and as such, the institution should be abolished. It doesn't mean that there will be nothing created to replace them, you know, but that the structure itself is completely flawed. Same for the prison system. It's beholden to no sort of real standard, um, and the standards that it is beholden to are the kinds of things that exist with such vague language that it's just they're they're so open to abuses everything we're seeing here things like cruel and unusual punishment what the fuck does that mean like shit like this you know so i think it's definitely true we need to be invested in abolishing these systems and then rebuilding whatever is necessary you know i think that it'll undoubtedly be necessary to do things like especially since every fucking wacko in America has a gun, it'll be necessary to have some sort of armed force that could disarm an individual in the instance of something like a mass shooting or something. Or if your neighbor is trying to break into your house and kill you, there should be someone that you could call that will come, you know, help you out of that situation safely to the best of their ability, things like this, you know. But, um... Article 4, um... I mean, the Fourth Amendment's kind of weird, the language of it. It says the right, people have right to be secure in their homes, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, who is affirming this? Right. Like, like what does that mean? This? So, un so, like, if someone thinks some guy's suspicious that just moved in in their neighborhood, they have the right to have their home searched. If they get a warrant, you know, but how easy is it to procure a warrant? We easy. see it all the time. Yeah, it's easy. And even if it's not easy, uh, you know, a cop can just plant weed in your car or something. So, I mean, th these things are all known, right? If we're trying to be theoretical strategists, let's try to think about what kind of proposed solutions, what kinds of things, because we're, we're all examining and observing these structural flaws, what kind of things could change them? Someone give me an idea of what you think needs to be a new law or amendment or something. If we're working within this system that we have, this constitution, let's assume that this is all we have to work with for now. What kinds of proposed strategies do you guys think we should come up with to alleviate some of these realities? Definitely people who are trained in like crisis handling and like um, domestic abuse and like, you know, stuff related to mental health. like. Maybe even having police, like, or whatever, people who are enforcing laws have more formal training. Like, you have to get degrees or something for that shit, not just, like, military training, essentially. Right, and this is something that's being discussed right now. I saw yesterday, I believe it was, or the day before, an Illinois uh, lawyer, I believe, proposed some new legislation 
I think it was an act, I think he's a law student actually, um, proposed that cops should be licensed because cops are not licensed and that's crazy. You have to have a license to be a fucking hairstylist, but you don't have to be a licensed policeman. They have some sort of weird licensing uh, procedure thing, but I believe that it like happens after you're already a cop and I'm not even sure what it exists to do. But yeah, I, I think what you just said, absolutely. Like, there needs to be a standard for much higher standards than the one that, that exists for how policemen uh, should operate. And what, how do you think that this could be enacted, though? I mean, aside from talks of things like licensing, you know, if we wanted to say we're tasked with actually making this idea real, that cops should be licensed, looking at what we're looking at right now, from what we've observed about the structure of government, what would be the law proposed to like instill such a thing? Would this happen at the state level, the federal level, the local level? I think it would it should happen at a local level and people should elect their own cops and the the police shouldn't have instead of I think it's like nine hundred hours of training, it should have like years of training. Mm. But in it's Europe not training, it's, it's, it's like school, you know, it's treated more like university or whatever. Yeah. In Europe, it's standard for cops to have around uh, two years of police training before they actually become policemen. And here it's 900 hours? It's, it's actually 840, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> hours. Yeah, that's that plus what, like... eight hours of conduct. So they get literally one day of like conduct training with their. <sighs> why, why do you think, though, Kami, that that should be a thing that's enforced at the local level? Because I feel like a lot of communities won't uh, enforce this kind of thing, you know? And then they'll be able to commit abuses against their own people. Communities like people within their own communities know what they need most and what they need to be policed most and people outside but what of that. about people what about people who are vulnerable within their own communities i mean there's so many mixed communities i mean look at places like new york city where is the lines of community drawn you know and also thinking about how people have freedom of movement i mean you might live in a great community you don't feel like there's any marginalized people within your own local community, but what happens when you go to the community next door and they have completely different standards of how they should be treating people and stuff like this, you know? Do you think that this could really be, like, enforced well? It, it seems like, if anything, you know, more insulated communities and more, like, you know, super racist, super conservative communities, they would just have even more lax standards of policing, and then people who unfortunately stumble into those communities are really fucked. Hmm. Yeah, I guess that, that wouldn't be good then. In places like New York City, where it's extremely segregated, and then you have gentrification, yeah, and also to think about, like, I, and this is a topic that's come up. I don't want to, like, get too into it because we could go on forever. But in talks about, like, police abolition and stuff, I'm seeing a lot of, like, feminist-type arguments. People are talking about things like, you know, how women feel like they're incredibly vulnerable, uh, even though it's definitely true that there really is no real protections against things like rape and shit. I mean, barely any rapes are prosecuted, and if they are, barely any lead to a conviction. But I think it's definitely true that women still want the hypothetical uh, possibility of being able to, like, call somebody if somebody is trying to sexually assault you, you know, like, literally in the moment. Because I've seen a lot of defenses raised, like, oh, well, rape's not prosecuted anyway, who cares and shit. And it's like, yeah, but what about when literally something is happening? What about when literally I'm, like, being pulled into a van, you know? Like, I would at least, it's also true that not all women, I think, even this is problematic and cops don't do a good job here, but I, I would hope that you could, like, call someone, you know? But, like, I think women in all communities, across all racial boundary lines especially, are going to be more vulnerable, you know? So this is something that, thinking about things like community policing, too, like, I feel like, you know, 
women and children especially will become really vulnerable especially since police forces tend to be overwhelmingly male like are we gonna we should think about these kinds of things too if we want to turn to more community policing solutions like how will that be enacted you know that's like i've seen other people talking about like like no, something I wanted to say. I'm, I'm pretty sure, like, it got cut off. Uh, oh yeah, you got cut off before. Welcome back. Mm-hmm. Welcome back. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. Like, I was arrested back in uh, 2016 for a weed charge, and like the the biggest basis of it was they arrested me because they thought I was gonna rob some. Like, like I robbed. They they thought I robbed someone's home of their TV. And like computers and shit. And like what really happened was I, I was just walking back home from a friend's house and like I was just dropped off. I was with my homies and shit. And really like on, on some probable cause shit, they just said that we, we should just arrest this guy anyway. And I feel like that wasn't necessarily their real motive. That's how I kind of feel about it. Like I feel like that wasn't their real motive. But because I had weed on me, that was the biggest thing. So I can't really necessarily blame the police, but like, even then, it's not safe for people like of my color to just walk the streets, even at like 1 a.m., 2 a.m., especially in the South. And that's mm-hmm. just weird to me. Mm-hmm. It's just like, wow, like, man, I'm on a fucking, look, 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 look at me, man. I'm on a fucking orange skateboard, a fucking penny board, bro, from Australia. And I'm skating home, and you're looking at me, and you're saying, man, this guy must have a TV on him, or he must have a fucking, he must have a television on him, or something. And I'm just like, for real? For you real? know what, though? Earlier, what? I don't know if people can hear me or not, but earlier we were talking about the KKK and how, you know, nobody knows what they actually do or what are they doing. There was this whole investigation into them a while back. They have this whole system where they try to infiltrate the police. Um, what's the word? The police academies and stuff like that. And they try to get hired in those okay. positions so that mm-hmm. they can use the law against people that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, because that's what it sounds like happened to you, Torn. I'm so sorry that that happened to you. But yeah, it's like I, they didn't believe you had a TV on you if you're just like out here skateboarding. It's obvious that you don't, you know. They're Look. probably just they they want to lock you up because you're a black man out here, like and th- you the police are I'm a racist. Black man out here, I'm still not gonna say I'm like against the KKK, because even though they're gonna be like, I had weed on me, like maybe he's attempting to distribute. Like even then, like I got off with charges that they're gonna say like, yo, we can just fucking erase this shit. Like this is your first offense. I don't smoke weed anymore in Georgia for that same fucking reason. Like I'm never gonna smoke weed in Georgia. I fucking hate Georgia. I fucking hate this place, man. But like, Get out of there. <laughs> I'm fighting. I'm fighting for people to just like, cause that that's a whole medicine. That's probably something that I fucking need. Like, cause I've been smoking CBD wraps. Cause Georgia has been lenient on like things like CBD. Like, so we have raw hemp wraps. There's things that you you know raw raw wrap papers. They have hemp wraps and shit. I can fucking smoke nicotine. I've been smoking nicotine since I was twelve. I can buy that shit off a fucking white dude. But you know mm-hmm. what? Hey, look at this other motherfucker who died. Look, he's a black nigga. A whole ass nigga died because he was selling cigarettes. It's crazy. Can, can I ask you, because you seem to like reemphasize that you're not necessarily against the KKK. I feel like that's a specific like feeling that you hold. Like, what what is your reasoning behind that? My biggest reason is because I feel like in the future the KKK is gonna need us, just like they needed everybody in the KKK. Like when I mentioned it in the nineteen, like when I said the nineteen twenties, like this was the biggest thing that sparked information for me. Like, I have a friend in uh, in Georgia. I haven't talked to him in a long fucking while. I'm not sure if he still lives where he still lives. And I would love to talk to him at least one more or two more times. Because the last time I talked to him, 
I told him that I was going through struggles, like real fucking struggles. And he, he's he's a white dude. I, I'm not sure how what or what anything he is, because like you know how like some people like to like say, yo, I'm part of this race or that race, or whatever the fucking race. And it's just like, yo, look, bro, I fucked with you before all that shit, before you could even tell me that shit. Like I want to tell you this right fucking now. And it's just like, man, he 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 put me on some information. And he told me this. He said, the cavalry marched on Washington. The KKK, they marched on Washington. And they told the president what was up. And it was the funniest shit. Because recently, I haven't seen advertisements on YouTube. I haven't seen too much of them nowadays. Because they were saying, hey, you should sign the president's birthday card. I'm not sure how many of you are going to sign it. You probably should, because I don't think I'm going to find it. Like, like, just say some <laughs> real shit. Like, for real, for real. But, like, <laughs> like even then, I was like, man, I, <laughs> I was like, man, I wish, I wish, like, Black Lives Matter was on that same type of level to tell, like, not even Black Lives Matter, like, All Lives Matter, like, it's like, yeah. Even if you with All Lives Matter, man, like, you with Black Lives Matter. I, that's how I feel. Even even the KKK, I know people. And this is rib but this is very personal for me. It's like I wish I could tell more of the story. It's just, it's it's crazy. It's scary for me. Yeah. You got to be careful. I feel like I feel like I'm coming to understand your viewpoint like are, is what you're saying is that you feel like organizations like the KKK and some of these other right-wing organizations actually have the right idea as far as like when they're trying to or how much historically they've uh been opposed to the federal government i mean things like these armed protests that are happening and shit where they're just like marching in with guns and shit is that the attitude that you feel that you kind of think uh other groups should should get more on board with and that's the thing that you're admiring about some of these groups and think that that any revolutionary movement could like use them one day is this what you're saying it's not necessarily that it's like, personally i don't like guns i've never loved guns and i was looking at the second chapter of the kkk and they never were really again they were never really with violence i'm sorry violence i'm sorry and like even then it's just like the kkk uh as a black man, like I look to them and I'd be like, they were able to do this. And like, I always hold up, hold up, hold up. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Um, it was so, there was so much I wanted to say, like, fuck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, like, um, it's not so much that I, I want, I want to be like them. It's not so much that I want to be like them, but like when they said they were against violence, you can look at that fucking the example that they set on Michigan. On Michigan, when they said, "Yeah, we have we have guns. We're gonna we're going up to the fucking the government. We're going up against the government." They didn't have to use those guns, and they didn't. And I'm pretty sure you saw it too. Like I'm not sure who was who was there. Probably Antifa too. There was a bunch of white men there. They were they were protesting. In Michigan, next thing you know, motherfucking, all this shit's going down. You have Michigan's cop, Michigan cops kneeling with the Black Lives Matter, and it's fucking wild. It's fucking crazy. But like, what I can really say so far is like, in the future, I feel like it's not that Black Lives Matter or Black people are just gonna need the KKK. To help and reach out with us, we are gonna need the KKK. We like I, I feel like it's it's always gonna be the KKK as far as what they do, but like when some real shit happens, when they really feel it, when they really fucking feel it, and I hope they feel it. I genuinely hope they feel it. Like they're gonna need us. And we can't really speak for them. And I can't speak for them. I wish I could. Cause I know I, I remember I remember when people walked up to me because I was like, yo, you know what? Fuck it. I should just join the KKK. And you know what they said? Hey, guess what? The KKK is opening up black memberships in Oregon. And I was like, you know what? Fuck it, nigga. I should just move to Oregon. 
I was like, you know yeah, what? Yeah, like, I kind of identify with what you're saying, too, and, like, even the ACLU defended the KKK. I mean, their freedom of speech, so that goes a long way, saying, you know, we stand with you with your free speech, but also, you know, That's really what act- it comes down to. Being actively against racism is, you know, it's, it's like a weird spot to be in. We can only move forward. That's how I see it. And I was talking to an army veteran about that shit. And he, I was, I was talking to him in Michigan. I was smoking weed with him, really. <laughs> and he, he told me, really, probably before we even sparked the blunt, he was like, man, the best advice I could probably give you is just keep moving forward. And I was like, for real? It was like, yeah, man. It was like, yo, that's the best advice I've ever gotten in my life. It's like, for real. No matter what fucking happens, just keep moving forward. It's like, even if, if I, like, because I've talked, I probably talked to more KKK members than I think I know. And I don't think I know any of them. I don't know any KKK members, as far as I know. And my homie that I know down here, I know, I know as much to know that he probably isn't about that shit no more. And I stand with him. And he's forever. Like, I will, I will always remember him. Even though I probably don't have his contact information no more, because he's really fucking cool. <laughs> I wish I still knew him. He's cool as fuck, man. Damn. But yeah, that's all I, I have to say about Yeah, him. I feel you. Like, I used to be friends with this dude that was um, ex skinhead type of dude. His family. He grew <laughs> up with his parents being part of fucking, like, neo Nazi white nationalist skinhead groups and shit. And that's just how he grew up. And later on, we became friends. And it was like, I don't know, I saw it from a different light. Like, those people, you know, they have these ideals, but I feel like, you know, there is possibility for those people to have change. And, like, I saw that with, you know, this person that I was close friends with at the time. That's, like... I think uh, what these groups have in common, though... Sorry, did I interrupt you? Oh, sorry, no, it's fine. Um... Oh, um, I think what these groups have in common... Is like they're part of the same My class or whatever, <laughs> and like these, um, like the U.S. just has no was, class consciousness whatsoever. Um, My dad. Wait, can you hear me? Hello. I just a little yeah. bit just now. Oh, I was just. I thought you guys cut out, and then I was talking because I thought Torn cut out, and then I realized I have been gone. Oh, no, I'm really was... sorry about that. I was talking to myself for like three minutes, and I was like, oh, "Guys," because no. I thought Torn yeah. cut out, but it was me. God damn it! I'm sorry. No worries. I, just... I, heard, I heard everything. I heard everything. No worries. Uh, yeah, wait. No, did was... you hear me talking? Yeah, I didn't hear. Yeah. I didn't hear anything. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm here now. <laughs> Tick, can you hear Cami? Because it just seemed like you might not have been able to hear her. Um, I did, but I, I did took a second. Um, I, but I was in the process of 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 of, of, t- of taking my my head my headphones off, so that might that might have been been part of it. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know which was went first. <laughs> Are we yeah, talking so about? I was just gonna what? say, um, just talking about you know, kind of hate groups and the potential for change. It's weird because it's like. I don't know, like, my my dad is, um, oof, he's a character, um, he's not in any kind of group, but, like, he is so, <laughs> he's, he was very, very, he is, I mean, a pretty racist person, um, and spent most of his life even more racist. Um, there was a point in my, in my life, I think I was, like, 11, I don't know. Um, where he sat me down, sorry, knocked over a wine bottle. He, he sat me down in the passenger seat of his truck and he taught me to tie a noose because it was something every redneck needed to know how to do. And I didn't know what that meant for years the fuck? until I realized, and it, I mean, it hits you like a fucking train, but like, I feel very grateful that um, <laughs> I fell more in line with my mother's very hippie ideology than I ever did his. But now it's like, we had a conversation um, 
you know, we have a difficult relationship and <laughs> I'll admit that's part of why, but um, he is currently has custody of my biracial niece and nephew. And it's been a weird learning experience for him. Um, you know, he was talking about, he was staying in the hospital and he lives in like rural, rural Kentucky. Um, and he was in the hospital for a pancreas, a pancreas thing. Um, and he realized that he and one of the nurses lived on the same street and they were talking, they were trying to like, um, place each other and he told her about where he lived and she said oh that's the house with the little colored girl and like literally this was this year this wasn't like I mean this was like a few months ago um, and he talked to me about like what a weird eye-opening experience it was for him towards his own beliefs and like I don't know, he talked about it just kind of put a lot of things into perspective that he had never thought to question. And so I don't know, it was just like, just speaking of that weird growth, but at the same time, it's hard for me to like, I don't know, you know, like as his daughter, like I'm proud that he's made this change, but at the same time, it's hard for me to like applaud it, seeing as it took him fucking 56 years, you know? Um, but I don't know. It's 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 kind of weird to like try and grapple people's potential for change and growth and learning with like how unnecessarily long that process can be. I don't know. That was just a just speaking of people raised by <laughs> racist extremists. That was something that I thought about. <laughs> I I think multiple things can be true, and I I think the text that we read tonight. Um, if you, if any of you didn't read it, please, please go read it. Because he speaks to this idea specifically, this question of ideology and how, and how, I, how of trying to tackle racism from an ideological perspective is absolutely necessary because no matter what, everything can at a certain point be reduced to ideology. White supremacy itself has a philosophy and an ideology. And even though it's true that it's enacted in really material ways, ways that are enforced by laws and systems of economics and all of these material ways, there is still a core ideology there. So I think that we need to avoid falling into the trappings of thinking that, oh, we can reform racism and this is what we should do or focus our efforts on, because I think, like, Tick is sort of expressing to us, you know, this this kind of seems like a vain effort, first and foremost, but beyond this, it's like, well, how useful is this really, you know? I don't think that th this thing would even be sufficient for people to, like, sit around and try to teach KKK people and other racist people who aren't in the KKK. I mean, America is so racist. Like, what is the use of trying to convince people to be less racist? And this is something we should be actively fighting against, I think, this idea, because a lot of people, and especially a lot of liberal Democrats, seem to have idea have an idea that this is what needs to happen if we want to overcome racism and it's totally naive and stupid and does a huge disservice to the black community in particular who is literally dying at the hands of these racist agendas while white liberals are all discussing oh like peace and love let's reform racist and shit you know at the same time though there is absolutely utility and a necessity to trying to tackle racism ideologically you know and I think that this is not an impossible goal, and we should be invested in doing this. But I think that maybe the key thing to do is to frame it from the understanding that, you know, this doesn't necessarily need to be seen as some sort of moral struggle, necessarily. That the utility in reforming racists is uh, because then there'll be better people in the world, and that will be good for you and good for everyone, or whatever, you know. There's actually a usefulness in reforming racists. Like, a lot of people talk about reforming racist people as if, like, you know, it's just what we should do because everybody can, like, be a good person and we should all be invested in making people good people. Like, that might be true to people on an individual level, but I think it's neither here nor there. It is useful to try to reform racists, 
uh, even if you don't personally forgive them. And I think that that, need, that that could be completely inconsequential. It doesn't matter. Who the fuck cares who forgives who or whatever. Some people will choose to. Some people will choose to not. I mean, forgiveness isn't even really a fucking real thing except like a verbal affirmation. I forgive you. Who fucking cares? But there is definitely a utility in this too. So we shouldn't get lost in arguments about whether or not they deserve forgiveness or this or that. You know, I think this is inconsequential. But if we know for a fact that people can be shown to reform at least in a certain way, even if we think that they still will likely remain racist the rest of their lives, even in ways they might not identify themselves, if this is showing some sort of usefulness, then we should be investigated in doing that too, you know? Sorry to rant. I just think it... A lot of the conversation right now, too, is who is the one educating and kind of like bringing forth these ideas of like an anti racist, you know, movement. And it seems like a lot of it's falling on, you know, black people, colored people, minority groups, and just like aggravates me to the core that it's. It's not my responsibility to educate white people about, you know, these certain topics. And like, I study a lot in school, you know, I, that's pretty much the basis of every class that I ever take is, you know, like an anti-racist, you know, education and, you know, reform and stuff like that of like the education system. And it's just like, it's all put on the backs of colored people and you know minorities in these certain groups when really I don't think it's their job to do that work. I mean it it is, but it it's just like a lot to put the pressure on those people. Right. And what is the usefulness of allies that aren't even interested enough to actually look up what black people have already said about this issue because you i mean black people have published books upon books upon books of speaking about this issue there's no it's there's no difficulty in finding these materials you know so how good is is an ally quote unquote who is like just asking black people to explain themselves more and more as if this information doesn't just exist in the fucking world already you know it's pretty tiresome be honest like i wrote a paper um like a couple months ago um one of my professors wrote a book about um anti-racist education um in elementary school and in the chapter it was talking about you know white identity and how you know white people don't you know the whole i don't see color and you know they don't you know understand like their privileges and their identity as being white and navigating through the world and I'm just so sick of that conversation because I understand it because I'm living the experience like it's a tiresome conversation to be having over and over and over again and that's what I wrote in my paper I was just so I couldn't write anymore I was like I already like I know this I live this I experience it and it's just tiring very tired yeah dude I imagine it's exhausting um I'm sorry for that. This fucking sucks. Especially since, yeah, it's like, I mean, literally, I, I think that's why it's so hard for white people to understand because, uh, I mean, this knowledge is mostly experiential. Like, you learn about racism by experiencing it. You see all the subtle, nuanced ways in which it works in society because you're always the recipient of it in, like, even the most arbitrary daily interactions, you know? Like, white people have absolutely no comprehension of what this feels like or how this works, you know, because they, they only hear about it, we only hear about it from black people and from other non-white people who tell us about these things, you know, it's like, but, but that's still not an excuse, you know, because I don't think it takes rocket science to see the truthfulness in, like, any of what you're saying, even the most even the things that seem the most hard to access, you know, in the sense that I can't envision what something feels like, it's still, like, all pretty transparently obvious, you know? I don't think all of these things are half as difficult as a lot of white people want to make it seem like, you know? And also constantly saying, oh, I don't understand. I mean, I don't know how you feel about this, but I kind of feel like, you know... Uh, there's also this attitude of white people just being like, oh, I can like, 
oh, I'll never, I can't relate. Like, it's like always this distancing away from like black people, you know, which I think is like called for to a certain degree, but it almost seems like you're absolving yourself of your capability to understand better, you know, to constantly be talking about, oh, I don't understand and so sorry. Like, it's like, what good is any of this, you know? It's like a lot of self-flagellating and I get it to a certain level and I think it's important to make sure you let people know that you don't get it the way people who receive racism get it. But it almost seems like pe white people are trying to like absolve themselves of accountability, you know, and trying to understand. Like just fucking read a fucking book. Like you're saying, I mean, all of this material exists. Like it's everywhere. Go read shit. Yeah, that's kind of like whole thing like about not seeing color and like this whole you know fucking left activist performative fucking bullshit that's on the internet right now and it's like they're putting out this message that's just like oh, we're, we are all the same they want to put things like you know whatever the fuck in their instagrams you know that whole blackout day bullshit you know it's performative and it's just like Okay, like equality is one thing, but equity is a thing that needs to be talked about. You know, reparations, you know, forms, like, mm -hmm. not just about equality. It's deep, it's way deeper than equality. It, it, we're past that point. Like, it's so much deeper than all of this. Right, and it requires so much diligence if you actually want to be a part of the effort to help black liberation efforts. And I think that that's the thing we're really witnessing right now too, you know? And why I was saying earlier, like I'm really annoyed with all of these white people just being like, do this, do they're copy pasting thing, copy pasting things, and then reprimanding other people for not sharing links and stuff. Like, it's like, dude, you know, somebody <laughs> came at me in like an Instagram comment. I hope you're not in here because they seem like a nice, good person. I, I'm not coming for them. But they told me to post links and I was kind of like, man, like I've just seen every like white person just post the same links. Oh, I put this mega link resource in my thing. It's just a hundred links. Like, are you are you telling me that all you people are out here sitting reading capital? Like one of the one of the things that's linked on these spreadsheets is is the fucking is like the Karl Marx work that's like hundreds of pages long. This person was white. What? Ask if this person was white, because that makes every bit of a difference. I think that they were, uh, Latina. I think that they were, I'm not entirely sure. I don't want to say. I, I just looked at their page for, like, half a second. I'm pretty sure it was a Latina uh, yeah, I was just saying, like, if they were, if they were white or white. Like, I feel like, too, there's a lot of policing within, you know, white allies, too. And it's like, you're not doing enough. or You're not understanding these concepts or you know, what we're talking about. And, and it's the same in feminism, too. It's, wim it's women against women. And it's like dividing themselves within that, you know, white space. So it's like a whole nother battle between the allies, even. Right. You're, not, you're not being, you know the right activist or you're not going about you know mobilizing in a certain way and really i mean most people shouldn't look to other allies how to mobilize they should be you know asking you know black and brown people you know what are the right ways that we can go about being an you know an ally to you not how are we good allies for each other you know what i mean Right. It's so performative, like you were saying, you know, it's like, oh, I'm going to be the best ally by reprimanding the other white people. And I'm going to post the me the mega link spreadsheet and shit because that's my service. And it's like, dude, you haven't done anything different. You copy pasted something versus posting a black square and you copy pasted something I know you are not reading. Like you think that's your work. Like people don't understand that if you want to actually be helpful in the battle against racism and police brutality, like it's a a lot of fucking work you got to do your fucking homework i mean that's why we're here we're like, we got to read and take fucking notes it is like doing homework you know like anything and this is like still a minimal effort like it, it's nothing you know calling someone and reciting this passage that some other white person told you to do who posted it who posted it who posted it 
It's like, that's not shit either, you know? It's just like, I feel like it, it really, white people are so far removed from this reality that they really are kind of, not colorblind, but blind in a sense, functionally blind to like everything that's going on. It's just like, it's just still just like this endless stream of just like the dumbest, most ignorant behaviors. Like they're just waiting for it to get better and be over with. Yeah, just fight your hardest to make it seem like you're an ally right now, and then soon you can go back to posting your bullshit, you know? And so right. that when people look back and they cancel whoever for this moment in time, you could say, oh, look, I did all the posts. I did my part. I did all the copy-pasting, and I posted mm -hmm. the, the link spreadsheet. Like, get out of here. And like Lex said, I mean, you, we should be reading black thinker they're asking black people what to do you know and they're not a monolith either they're going to tell you a million different things you know and so it's our responsibility to be getting a diversity of opinions like not just do what the nearest person tells you to do like black people don't agree on shit either you know there's so many things that we should be investigating and reading and getting getting a comprehensive view of all of the different viewpoints that exist in the black community. X. Shit. Well, speaking of doing homework, um, we can keep talking, but um, I did want to say that I want to I want to do this. Um, I think we should do it at least once a week for the next few weeks. Because, you know, this moment is really, uh, there's a lot of power behind this moment in time right now. And I think that it's in all of our best interests. And also, I think it's a responsibility to try and make use of this time, especially if there's all this, this force behind whatever happens next, you know. Now's the time we're already starting to see people propose specific legislation changes. Uh, Elizabeth told us earlier that they're talking about uh, disbanding the Minneapolis Police Department. Like, there are wins being won right now. And so if we want to be helpful in this, like, we should be diligent and keep reading not just so we can be useful now, but also in the future, so that, you know, the next time this happens, if this happens, that we also have ideas going into things instead of scrambling for, like, what do we do now, now that all these people are out on the streets, you know? I mean, this is how I feel personally about myself. I feel like I was unprepared for this moment in time. Like, I guess I never really even thought that, like, I'd see protests happen at this level about anything, much less a thing like police brutality, which... You know, white people never seem to give half a fuck about. I think that the pandemic really changed that, which I think you can take a cynical approach to and say, like, oh, they don't really care, which may be true to a certain extent. But the fact is that they're out there, so they should be being utilized, you know, if they can for this cause, whether or not they truly mean it or are motivated. Like, who gives a fuck? They're out there, so use them. But um, I'm going to, I don't have the reading uh for next week yet give me till tuesday and i'll post it in here so that we can meet again next sunday um i would like to read some we were talking about angela davis and fanon um other black revolutionary thinkers um and i think we should be reading these kinds of things alongside readings uh of uh, relating to the u.s legal structure like tonight you know i think next time we meet too we should talk more about this constitutional reading because we didn't get to go through all of it but also um maybe read uh, some supreme court cases civil rights legislation these sorts of things so we're familiarizing ourselves more and more with the structure of government here so we can uh rally support around some of these new legislation proposals and stuff like this and make sure that we're supporting the best plan of action to the best of our abilities you know if any of you have suggestions for readers we should be reading or ideas also lex you suggested watching a movie i think that that'd be a great idea i can stream video through here i'm gonna leave the text channel in here open for now even though i'm not really moderating so i'm hesitant to do that but i think it'll be fine but i'll post the readings and relevant links in the read only chat too so it won't get cluttered only i could post in there but um
yeah, we can keep talking. I just wanted to say that if anyone wanted to like get out of here, it's your opportunity to like do that. But I'm yeah, going to stay. I'll probably have to scoot. Okay. I forgot to make dinner, and it is <laughs> twelve thirty nine a.m. So I'm, I know it's late. Um, take my happy. But ass thank to you bed, for being here. This was a yeah. It was just very um, yeah. I had a very good, and I'm very excited. You're cutting uh, out. Oh, I just said, um, yeah, this was a really, this was a really good talk, and I'm very excited for the next one. Um, very excited to have heard perspectives um, that I've yet to hear in our past book clubs, um, and I will. I can't wait for next. Hell week. yeah! We'll Talk see you next you Sunday. Later. Good night, girl. Bye. Yeah, I'm still here. Craig, still here. Anyone have any other thoughts relating to this? Now that I've given people an opportunity to leave, we can go in a few different directions, but I'm interested in talking still. I've been trying, my problem right now, and part of why I'm doing this, is I still feel like I am not getting the big picture. And it almost feels like it's impossible to get the big picture because our government is so complicated with these three branches, how they all enforce each other. What, how is a thing like a Supreme Court precedent enforced? You know, like what, what, what's the relationship between like precedents established by Supreme Court cases and a thing like future constitutional amendments, you know? Like Supreme Court, court rulings can't contradict existing rights, right? Because they're all founded on, they're all, or yeah, they're all founded on pre-existing constitutional rights and articles. So it can't ever contradict the constitution, but do future amendments, are they uh, we informed could by Supreme Court rulings? Amendments, I mean, at, at, or at, like addition or you know, abolishing some amendments could be you know, a more foreseeable action. Their you know, whole revolution sounds, you know, you can't even, you could not even imagine. And, like, I physically cannot even imagine what that would look like. Yeah. And it's interesting you bring it up. We didn't get there. And I think we should continue the uh, discussion because there is too much, I guess, for, for today. But um, the the amendments we read, I believe it was the 18th Amendment, which was prohibition. It uh, made it illegal to sell liquor. That is the only amendment to have ever been uh, repealed ever or abolished. I'm not sure exactly what the legal term is but that's the only okay and that's the only one ever and it can only be abolished with the uh creation of a new amendment so the 21st amendment i believe it was abolished the 18th amendment and i think that's all that it exists to do so to change any previous amendment you have to pass a new amendment and this is also true for would be a a great place to start would you say or if let's say you know we had like pick one amendment to abolish i think at least the 13th would be a great start yeah yeah we didn't even get there yeah i was reading too earlier like i had it pulled up before but we were talking it, but I was reading, um, you know, the whole servitude, slavery, less of a punishable crime. It's in what I thought was interesting is that it was declared December of 1865, the same year, months later after the Civil War. As soon as the Civil War ended, that's when that declared. So that's yeah, because that's the amendment that abolishes slavery. But there's a it's, big fucking butt in uh, there. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> it abolishes slavery unless you're yeah. uh, <laughs> imprisoned. 
just how crazy. fucking like, convenient. And then now we have a justice system that just throws black people in jail in mess. Like, look at that. That's a pretty yeah. big fucking butt. So yeah, are you saying, Lex, that you think we should abolish the 13th Amendment and replace it with one that removes this big fucking butt? <laughs> or except for, rather? Absolutely. I mean, I have my own ideas, and I think a lot of people kind of have their own, you know, opinions about the justice system and all those well, share some of yours. Um, I mean, I... My dad been out of jail my whole life for you know selling drugs, nonviolent crimes. There's people, uh, close friends of mine in jail, life sentences, nonviolent crimes. You see, tons of black and brown people, nonviolent crimes, or white people of similar crimes, same crimes, same state getting more harsher punishments and I don't believe that people with nonviolent offenses should be in jail. I feel like the way jail is structured, everything about it is not working. It's obviously not working. We are imprisoning the amount of people more than anyone in the world. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not you know Putting them in a situation to be able to go back into society and not commit those same crimes. I mean, they're not, they're not fixing the problem at hand. You know, they're not talking about mental health. They're not talking about trauma. They're not, there's no therapy. There's, it's just, you're going to sit here in a cell, nothing. You have no rights. And that's a whole nother thing. You know, you get out of jail or you have a felony, you know, you don't have the rights to vote. You don't have the rights to bear arms. You don't have these certain rights. So you're, are you really even a citizen? Are you really even a, you know, like a person? Do you have rights, you know, at that point, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I absolutely agree with you. Like there should, there's no reason nonviolent criminals should be in prison. Like that's just absurd. And for violent criminals in prison, I think too, yeah, that absolutely needs to be addressed. That people who grow up in uh, surrounded by violence, of course, they're more likely to get involved with violence. You know, it's definitely a mental health issue on one level, but it's also like a, a thing that I think is is because of uh, survival reasons and shit. You know, if you live in a community that's overrun with gang violence and shit, like, of course you're going to want to defend yourself and maybe you have to ally with some gang if you don't want to get killed and shit, you know? People get involved in violence for all sorts of reasons. And this is absolutely a variable. What? I was just saying, it's literally a fucking cycle. Absolutely. The system's not breaking a cycle of poverty and, you know, violence. It's just literally putting people in and taking people just to go in the same fucking situation they were in when they fucking went to jail. Right. And to speak of, like, white people receiving lesser punishments, it's crazy because, like, I think that the people who grow up in uh, violent communities and shit, you know, they should be getting lesser sentences, if anything, than white people because what are white people's excuses, you know? Like, you just go out into the streets and, like, kill people or, like, go out and kill prostitutes or whatever? For what reason, you know? A lot of people in marginalized communities get involved in violence for practical reasons really sometimes reasons you know they don't even want to be involved in violence but that's all that they have in their local community you have to at a certain point defend yourself i think that's interesting like i think about that a lot too with um you know who's shooting up schools and who's you know creating these fucking just ass and things of violence, you rarely, never, ever see a brown person and a woman. I would like to see an example of a woman. It could. Be, I don't even care if they're if they're brown or not. I just want to see an example of a woman that created a, a fucking ass shooting or you know any type of violence towards anyone. A degree of white men. I cannot think right. of one. 
a one. I can think of a few, but literally just a few. Like, I'm sure it's, like, 1% or less. Like, and we only probably hear about them because they're women. Like, I, I know a few stories, and I think the stories are probably only told because they're women. Like, but I think... I think what you just said, you know, the fact that mass shootings are being enacted by white people, like you barely ever, ever see a black or brown person commit a mass shooting or a woman. I think that it speaks to this problem you were talking about earlier about white people just being completely blind to the fact that white existence is not some sort of neutral existence you know white people come to perceive it this way and this is why they say things like i don't see color i don't think about race let's stop talking about race that's the problem as soon as we all stop talking about it it'll go away and shit you know I think that white people are, we exist in such a culture of privilege and entitlement that we don't even realize that this is not a neutral viewpoint at all. It becomes the neutral viewpoint because it's the majority viewpoint, but it's not. Like, this absolutely influences your psyche, too. And I think that entitlement is the primary variable when it comes to a lot of these mass shootings because who who does it tend to be it tends to be men who like go out and shoot up people after their girlfriend dumps them after people were mean to them after they realized that they would never achieve their life goals they feel beaten down by the system like incel ideology you know it's kind of this culture of like a lot of these mass shooters and shit they they're like people who are incredibly entitled and I think that women don't really share in this these feelings of entitlement and neither do black and brown people, you know, like, I think that this is, it, it's so obvious that there is a problem with the white mindset and they're not, they're not used to, especially the white male viewpoint, you know, like they can't stand and they fucking crumble under like any affront to their entitled viewpoint, you know, so much so that they, there's so many, there's mass shootings like every fucking day and they're mostly by a white dude. Like, what the fuck? This is such that's a psychological like a problem, yeah. too. I feel like that's a whole nother, you know, it's not a whole nother conversation, but I think that, you know, men have, could have their own movement within themselves. You know, pay for themselves and whatever they need to do, because I think men's mental health isn't talked about. You know? Especially in the black community, yet you don't see black men. Mm -hmm. Outrageous act. No, I wouldn't go as far as saying. I don't know. It's kind of hard to say movement, but it's like think of like a movement has to be has to be, but usually is someone that is being oppressed when really most fashion other than black men, but. Yeah, I think men of all races have their own distinct problems, you know, and you're right that I think only they can fix it. And this makes me think of the text, too, when he's talking about self-determination and how at a, uh, he believes that, you know, black liberation efforts will require white allies. I think just by principle of the fact that most people in America are white, and so it re will require that manpower, but also that, you know, efforts for black liberation should be should theoretically not rely on white allies you know because they white people can't be expected to understand they'll never understand exactly at least not in the way black people can all the ways in which racism works you know black people are the only expert on anti-black racism they'll never be a, a, a white person who is more educated on that than the most educated per, black person on this issue you know so I really liked what he was talking about with self-determination. I think that this is true for any movement, you know, like women shouldn't create theoretical feminist movements where the goal relies on like male participation or something, you know. It's probably going to become a practical issue that yes, we need like male people to support us, but if we want to accomplish things, like we have to we have to work within our own demographic and can't expect like you know other groups to be a part i mean not to get into feminism mm -hmm. but i feel like this is one of the major problems with feminism at a certain point people started saying feminism is for everybody 
feminism is good for men too which i feel like was just trying to get men to like listen it's like no feminism is not for men men are not feminists like stop with this like women need to lead this movement we need self-determination forget all this shit trying to convince people that feminism is for everyone because look what's happened too people like police the fuck out of feminism now literally people act like feminism is like the ymca you know like we do everything like what is supposed to be a movement for women like now it's just literally feminists are expected to like do everything and be experts on everything and fight for men too, fight for men's mental health like no they need to take care of that themselves you know i don't think minority groups be liberated they depend on their oppressor to be liberated right that will never work the whole conversation that we that we've had with porn it's like in that industry the industry relies on men specifically and pretty much only can women's sexual liberation even exist in the porn industry reliant on consumer being all fucking men right and and also not just men but men who are like incredible misogynists i mean and what makes them purchase this content is this atmosphere of extreme misogyny you know they just like it's not even like oh they're just like purchasing nude images or something it's just like way beyond this but yeah like how could how could a thing like porn be liberating for women if porn wouldn't exist if there wasn't just a this overwhelmingly male consumer base like it's ridiculous I'm trying to think how it would apply to i guess with the you know anti-racist black liberation movement because it is heavily dependent on you know white people because that is the majority that is who's making the decisions that's who are the policy makers right now so it's like does that can that apply what's going on right now i don't really know i don't I think so we're relying think... heavily on those allies to do that work, the uh, oppressors to do the work. When we... right. Totally applies. Tell tell us why. We're in the twenty first century. There's too many of us, and like I said. When I was saying what I said, it was like, we can only go forward. And it's almost painful to see, like, everybody going this way. And, like, like I said earlier, it's like, they, li- they like to say, like, we're 13%. We commit 50% of the crime. But we're 13%. We're a part of all of America. Like, everybody in America is looking at us right now. We're, like, we're all from all different forms of all different walks of life. And it pains me to see, like, everybody just, like, trying to fucking stand up for each other. Just, like, whoop. Now, every, like, the, there there are us who agree with, like, we, we, we may lean left, but there are us who agree with some people on the right. There are us who lean left, who, are, who only agree with people on the left. And, like, there are us who are, we're just, like, sitting up here neutral as fuck. And we're just in the neutrality of it. And we're just, like, neutral as fuck. It's just, like, it it won't make sense. It, it, none of it really makes sense, but it's it's all there. Like, because we're right mm-hmm. here. We're right now. And we need to, we're trying to make our voice heard. And that's the biggest part of it. So, like, a lot of the stuff, even in the Constitution... It's dated. It's dated as fuck. Mm-hmm. They didn't account for what we were going to go through right here, right now. And right. it hurt. They didn't want this to happen. <laughs> they wanted slaves to stay slaves. They didn't envision a thing like this. Like, of course not, you know. And to to talk about, like, an analogy to, like, you know. Oh, sorry. Did you get cut off again, Torn? Are you there? No, that was me. I was going to interrupt. I'm still here. Don't worry. 
Oh, okay. I heard someone go, oh, I was like, wait, did you get cut off again? Who was that? Who's, it's me. Who says they have to talk? Who's me? I can't see Rachel. anything. Rachel, hello, welcome. Um, <laughs> but why, so why do you think, when you, when you say that during, when, you know, 1863, or was that, was that when it was? Um, why do you think they were not expecting this to happen now, or at some point? Do you think that, I mean, first of all, I know Lincoln, Lincoln's original solution was to send everyone back. I mean, it, there's some irony in his, his the way he's praised. I think. Um, I mean, first of all, I should for no one that for anyone that doesn't know who I am, I'm, I'm Canadian, uh, but I know a bit of the history, and you know, I I don't doubt that it was somewhat of a political move, um, but I do also know that he had, you know, one of his thoughts was to send everyone back uh back to africa that's what he believed would be the best thing um mm -hmm. that's kind of fucked up it's pretty fucked up it's just as fucked up as wanting or opposing the uh, abolition so i mean um i don't i don't know about that that what you said um you know in terms of uh not expecting this i mean whatever this means to happen like um it's what do they what do they think they can just uh, I mean yeah it's interesting to think like what was actually going through their heads is like okay do they think like is this done now you know like do we just let bygones be bygones like it, it's fucked up you know and look, it's like there's okay. hey my man's yeah look 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 man I'm I'm a fourth generation I'm a fourth generation I'm supposed to go to college I was supposed to go to college. I'm the fourth yeah. generation of my family to go to college. I'm a black man. My family has been here since slavery. Right? Yeah, so like yeah, yeah. even then one of the one of the greatest things that like this, this is probably like the best inside joke that I've ever had. My my great grandma, she used to say, Take me back where you get me from. Take me back where you get me from. Like, I always found that shit funny as fuck. Because I always used to think of that shit as like, like man, man, you need to take us back to Africa. <laughs> is is that the sentiment in, I mean, I don't know how to really word this, but is that a, a sentiment? To, no, to, to it's not Africa. even a sentiment, bro. It's, yeah. it's not even, it's not even literal. It's not even anything, man. But like, we're here. We're right here. We're right now. Like, how you going to send us here to work? We going to sit up here and work for you, right? In America. <laughs> like, I, I, understand you're, I understand you're Canadian. But, like, yo. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe you misinterpreted what I was trying to. Explain. No, 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 no. no. Don't, yeah. don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I understand. But, like, if, if you know a little bit about, like, the, the. If you know a little bit about, like, America. Like. A lot of these niggas that were in the south, bro, we were trying to get to Canada, bro. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Two of my old roommates were from Houston. <laughs> Texas. Oh, he, meant like, he meant like during the Civil War, Rachel. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> right. Yeah, I know two yeah, people yeah, from yeah. Houston. <laughs> Well, no, well, now, I mean, yeah, I just got mixed up because, you know, that was a big thing, too. Maybe. I don't know. My bad. Well, but, I think, I think what you were real. just asking, yeah. I think yeah. what you were just asking is, is if, if it's a supported idea that the, the people dealing, uh, writing the Constitution and shit didn't really have any set of foresight, because I said that I don't think they envisioned this would happen. What I meant was that I don't think they envisioned that slavery and its lasting effects and legacy would ever become a problem of this magnitude because that's partially because of this this white mindset where, you know, you don't see it as, as an issue that could do a thing like lead us to where we're at now, where people are protesting in 50 states in the year 2020, you know, and where racism is a thing that, you know, th this this administration that we have in power right now that's largely how we came to power by mobilizing 
racist people and a racist agenda, you know, like, I don't think they thought, I think they thought it would lead to problems, but I don't think they ever thought that it would lead to these kinds of problems because they didn't take the issue seriously because even the people of the North didn't see black people as people. They're like, oh, that yeah. sucks. We're going to have to go through some shit, you know, it's going to create difficulty, but whatever. They didn't think that it would ever become something where like white people are actually like embroiled in a fight for or against to this magnitude, you know. And Lex, I wanted to go back to something you said when you were thinking about like analogies for black people working within the system to a system that their oppressor, oppressors have created and how they can't truly be liberated inside the system. I think that the text we read spoke specifically to this, you know, and people like Malcolm X spoke to this idea a lot too, that things like the wins that were won during the civil rights era, they're won within the system of capitalist democracy, you know, and in that sense, they're not really going to the root of black liberation and what needs to happen if black people are to be truly liberated because the very system that we're in, like, I think black people can absolutely work within it and advance. But at the end of the day, like this system is built in a way where the white person is the standard, you know, and this this standard white people and black people are like intrinsically linked in this way, like the working class, you know, and this is why I think it's also I think in something that Lorenzo was speaking about in the text is that if white revolutionaries want to have their revolutionary moments then they need to wake the fuck up and realize that the f number one priority any movement, whether Marxist-Leninist or anarchist or whatever kind of white revolutionary movement you're leading, you can't treat slavery and its legacy as a footnote in American history either. There's going to be no class solidarity, no class consciousness or whatever, if you think that you can unite people only on the basis of like, we're all poor, I'm a poor white person, you're a poor black person, let's come together. Like, white people who want to have their revolutionary movements need to explicitly commit to an anti-racist agenda if you're not committed to dismantling white supremacy you're never going to have your revolutionary moment either so i feel like this is something that white people also are not treating with any sort of seriousness yet you know like communists and shit they're always talking about like oh we just need to band together class solidarity like over our economic struggles and then we'll overthrow the shit and then we'll abolish racism like it's not that fucking easy you know they need to be treating racism as like an explicit thing to tackle and then have the fucking revolution. It can't be a footnote for after the revolution because these systems are white supremacists in nature. Like you can't step outside of it. People don't realize how interwoven it is into literally all fabric of American society and economics. And something he talked about too, Still here, by the way. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Something he talked about too that I thought was really interesting is how the white working class still exists on the shoulders of the black working class, you know. And so even these talks about, and we see a lot of it, like, oh, you know, people bonding, for, forming some sort of solidarity over their class struggles as it relates to economics, you know, like these systems are so intrinsically linked where the success of even poor working class whites is still predicated on the exploitation of poor working class black people, you know. So there can be no class solidarity or class consciousness without fixing this first. You know, I think people really still, white people still have not even an inkling of the magnitude of racism, like how how it's really not, they treat it almost like it's some separate entity to everything else. We can weed it out and everything will be good. Like, it's not like that. It's literally in there. Like, you have to burn the whole fucking thing down if you want to fix shit. They think we can just find, find the source and eliminate it, but it's, it's not going to be that easy, you know? People still don't treat this issue with enough seriousness, and we're witnessing that now with the protests, you know? People, people are acting like, white people are acting like they're doing the most, going to the protest every day, doing this or that, reading this or that, but it's like, dude, this is still nothing. This is the tip of the fucking iceberg. Like, it's nothing. There's so much to do, and a lot of what we have to do is undoing shit and just overhauling the whole fucking system. 
It's a lot of fucking work. I mean, yeah. I mean, we don't. We have different racism up here with you know First Nations, and I don't know what you guys think of what Canada is, but it's pretty fucked up too, uh, historically wise. Um, you know, with our national police, and do they have a state like a federal police force in the states? They have all. States, other than like other than just the the. Yeah. They have like a local, like you'll have like locals, and then you'll have like a sheriff and like state police. And high, right, right, right. So I guess yeah, state is is like the the federal. Um, is it state police? Are they federal? I guess that makes no. sense. No. No. Well, I mean, there's state like, police. Um, like I know, like where I'm from too, they have like a lot of like reservation police too that I would assume are like still federal too. Right. Yeah, there's I mean, really interesting laws with reservation police, actually, and how they do that. Like, you know, there's certain like reservations. Are fucked up. What? So fucked up. Like, where I grew up in Wisconsin, it's like I lived technically on a reservation, and it's like the jurisdiction of it all is all fucked up. Like, oh yeah, you can't. Yeah. They, yeah. Well, there's certain yeah. reservation areas and shit too, where like the government uh doesn't have jurisdiction the federal government or the yeah. local government and it's weird because you know people frame it as like oh that's them making concessions to native americans but the reality is that they're kind of letting they're kind of like wiping their hands clean of certain things like i read about there was some murder case a few years ago and nobody was prosecuting for it because it happened on like native land or something but I think the community was upset because they wanted to remove this murderer from their land, you know, but I think that they weren't even able to, like, bring him to trial because of some weird laws about this shit. I mean, it's fucked up. Like, in Canada, the RCMP, so, like, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, like, originally they are like, horse, because it's from the 20s, but they are like, horseback police, like, the guys you see in red with the weird pants and shit. But they were essentially established one one of the main things was to round up first nations people and put them in residential schools um like they would just like straight up go and kidnap children from families uh and put them in these christian schools and the last one closed in 1996 um wow yeah and uh i mean the, the, there's so much crazy like 2 days ago uh some First Nations woman was just murdered by a cop. Uh, it was supposed to be uh, her Her boy. She moved across the country, whatever, to start a new life. And her boyfriend called the local police saying, uh, you know, like, oh, fuck, it's terrible. I don't remember her name. But um, she's she's been telling me that she's been being stalked by this dude. So can you go check up on her? I haven't talked to her in a day. And it's supposed to be just like a wellness check. So they call it. And she ended up fucking getting shot five times, like unarmed. The, the guy just fucking bolted into her apartment. And in another case, there's, so we don't have any sort of stand your ground. There's, there's no, you literally cannot use a gun in Canada for any means other than hunting or like target shooting. And there was this case in the prairies in Saskatchewan where this, uh, I guess, you know, in a reservation town, this this drunk teenager was trying to break into some dude's car on a farm and the farmer came out and just blasted him. And his he was acquitted because he claimed, he somehow managed to claim self-defense. And we don't even have a self-defense law. It's, it's fucking bizarre. So, I mean, like, I don't, yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm always interested because it's funny every time I, you know, hang out in the States or, or meet people from the States or I was like, oh yeah, Canada, you know, it's so great up there. And I mean, yeah, it's, I think Canada's just got a massive front. Yeah, I mean, I think all, racism is not local to any country. No, no. You know? And it's not like, like we were talking about earlier, it's not because everyone just arbitrarily has some sort of visceral hatred for people that are not white, although that is a byproduct of our racist systems, but it's the structures that, of colonialism and conquest 
yeah, that yeah. rearranged the structure of the world, you know, displaced so many, so many millions and millions of people into the Caribbean, into just... the U.S. You know, like, we created a whole new format for the world, and capitalism further concretized this reality, you know, that that the whole world is now embroiled in a white supremacist structure you know we need to dismantle it on a global level it won't go away and like people don't realize i mean america is just so fucking liberal like we see this mantra repeated over and over again like whatever's not hurting you is fine you know we have such a liberal mindset like do whatever you want like people don't even realize that the fact that they can just live in this like fairy tale and do whatever they want as long as it's not hurting anyone and whatever like literally everything is linked to something else the reason that any of us in america can like have wealth and eat the way we do and wear the clothes we do and have the technology we do and have any standard of living is predicated on other people suffering you know like our success and our well-being is predicated on other people's suffering so there should we need to abandon this completely liberal mindset of like individualism and everyone just wants to live their life and stuff you know this is the same kind of liberal approach to like these talks about like we just got to teach people to love each other like i don't see color shit you know like it's more than that this is not a an individual problem this problem is literally global and it's interwoven into fucking everything like like you were saying earlier about the the you know the, the mass shooters the 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 kind of that incel uh, archetype um you know i i when you think about like if you try to understand what like what what was the catalyst and I, you can probably reduce it down to you know some obviously twisted perception of what it means to be a quote successful unquote human um and a lack of validation um but so like i'm i'm interested like why like you were saying like there it's like it's probably 99.8 percent white males right like so what 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 is i mean i i don't know the numbers but I'm, i'd be interested to see you know, on a on some sort of timeline, like when this started to come and how that would relate, um, you know, to uh, to popular media um, advert. You know, I, I I have always thought that advertising and public relations have played a big part in that, um, and just the you know propagating the myth of being like what it means to be a successful American or a successful person. In, Personally, you know. I would like yeah. to say that that whole myth mythology around the incel started around the 2010s, like the early 2010s. Right. Well, no, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I'm not, I don't necessarily mean the, the myth about the incel thing. I mean, just the, the, oh wait, maybe I misspoke. I, 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 what I meant was I'd be interested to see when all these mass, like when, when, when did the curve start to go up in terms of these mass shootings? It hasn't um, though. It's just the weapons have changed. It's been this way since the 14th century and earlier. White males have been the, yeah. the people who lead all of these acts yeah. of colonialism, of conquest. This is a viewpoint that's been building for centuries and centuries and it's just reinforced by things like media and shit and right. current realities every every century but it's just you know the the certain variables change but this is a mindset that's been building for centuries and centuries you know that's why it's so hard to even get people to see it because it's become a thing that mm -hmm. almost resembles objectivity like white males right. like to f how often do we see this kind of talk from white males in particular as if like facts over feelings bro like my right. objective viewpoint i look to science and this and that it's like no you don't your viewpoint is just as heavy heavily biased by identity and shit it almost re represents some sort of like ontological handicap i feel like yeah. white people like to pride themselves on feeling like oh we're so unburdened by the troubles of racial identity and identity period i don't identify with my race i don't identify with my gender i don't do this or that and you've come to feel as 
as if this means that you have a more objective viewpoint. But this is a handicap because you don't realize that your viewpoint is no more objective than anyone else's, you know. It's so enmeshed in your identity as a white person, as a white male, you know. You just can't even see it. If anything, you're a handicap much more than other people because you can't fucking see it. Right. And so, I mean, like, so why, what about, do you think there's a correlation with that? And, um, I mean, I don't, I, does, I, IQ is definitely not the correct term, but uh, ability to, to critical, or to, uh, I, I mean, I'm essentially what I've gathered, I mean, from what you just said is, is there's a problem with this sort of uh, egocentric um, kind of uh, hustle culture. That's related to you know these objective things about um, uh, you know what it means to be. Uh, where am I going with this? Like I, it's just interesting what you said about what, like how. Uh, let me just try and gather my th <laughs> thought here. Um, you know, in in terms of of what I mean, maybe you guys have discussed this already. I mean, obviously, I came in late. Uh, to the discussion, but w what is it about? I mean, yeah, it, it's is it not just an an inability to to like uh, understand, uh, you know, real well, whatever reality reality from like a critical perspective, or like how did how do they get lost in? Not taught, I guess I would say. Sorry, can you kind of kind of. I was just saying, like, I'm an education major. But yeah. um, a lot of what I study is talking about, like, at a young age, kids aren't taught to think critically and, you know, right. question the nature of their reality. And education already puts, you know, this white supremacy framework on young children at a young age. So they're learning, you know, these biases and these, you know, prejudices and gaining their ego at a young age right i think it's just learned well so i mean isn't there an aspect of you know early childhood development that i mean from what i understand it's that there is a natural um instinct for inquisition in early childhood development and the problem is is when that stuff gets suppressed or misguided, I guess, which is like what you're what you're saying. I mean, obviously, they're not just born racist. These views are passed on. You know, you 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 are your parents. Um, Most definitely. Yeah, um, and I mean, so like, I mean, I I have always been interested in in you know constantly thinking of where I'm at. I'm mixed race. My I grew up in uh, a small town with maybe four or five people of color um and i i uh, i'm like i'm racially ambiguous uh no one knows where i'm from they everyone like 90 percent of people ask uh 90 percent of people assume i'm first nations because i'm canadian but if i'm in depending on where i'm in the south or in the states you know it's uh, it, like latino or it, people just don't fucking know but they just ask so like hey, man, it don't matter. You Native American if you feel like that, bro. <laughs> but that's another thing I think too. Like, like a lot of white. If you're like mixed race, like I'm mixed race as well. But like white people, you're just fucking brown. Oh, like, that, I'm fucking yeah, real for real. Like, that's how it is, man. People are the same. If you're not like dark skin, like, black, they're like, oh, you're fucking whatever I want. <laughs> Well, no. See, the, the thing is, I'm I'm t technically Asian, but I mean, I'm also technically a Pacific. I, like, there's so many yeah, fucking yeah, categories, yeah. And, and in Canada, I mean, like Asian Asian is like so. Well, I mean, it's just blanket is the same. Mm -hmm. It's just such a blanket term, and it's like it's it's so bizarre to. And then you know, obviously, all these um, uh, what do you, you know. Um, things are implied being that I am Asian, you know, it's like, so what, what does it mean to be Asian? You know, I don't have the culture in me. Um, my mom is, you know, essentially 
West Westernized. She's white. Well, she came. She left the Philippines when when she was twelve in nineteen seventy one when there was a massive government coup, uh, and like shitload had of people, shitload of people had to leave because they were killing people. And so you know, and then she came and, and you know, my dad's a prairie boy from the well, from the prairies, but so I don't have the white identity. Um, I don't necessarily have the Filipino community identity. So it's um, it's just always been uh, this uh, ongoing. Oh, I, I hate the word investigation. Yeah, I understand what you're saying completely. Like, especially to like a whole other conversation to not even just like being like black, mixed, or, like whatever mixed you're, especially when it's with another, if you are white, another, you know, ethnicity of color or whatever it is, you're torn between oppressed and the oppressor and you yeah you know, there are two identities but like say for me personally like i should never pass as white so i can't navigate yeah. my life trying to be white I have to, or at least i do identify you know as black so it's like this whole identity crisis almost being you know this person and how to navigate the world and you know colorism does exist and it's like you have to recognize that you a mixed race person like this whole fucking thing like yeah shit is uh right. fucked up <laughs> i mean i i can tell you this much like uh in, in my own personal history i can tell you like uh my mother on my mother's side of the family like we're related to um we're we're, we're more so related to like the japanese and the native americans and I don't know exactly how that shit happened. Because how, how the fuck did Japan come over to America? Like, I don't understand it. Like, we, we, I, have a, I have a Japanese great-grandmother uh, or auntie or some shit. I haven't fucking yeah. done the research on it myself. I know it's there, though. Like, uh, I know I'm, like, somewhere in my fucking bloodline. Like, it's going to say, like, hey, uh, one of your family members came from Japan. Are you okay with that? I'm just like, nigga, I don't give a fuck. Nigga, Are I'm you here. okay with that? <laughs> why, why the fuck would I not be okay with that? Like, bro, I'm, I exist. <laughs> what you mean? This well, like... I mean, I don't necessarily know about Japanese history, but I mean, Japanese, Japan, Japanese people have, you know, a, a big history in Canada. Uh, and, you know, there was a thing at the outbreak of World War II. They had internment camps, which, you know, a lot of fucking people died. Um, because like they in just Canada? round, yeah. With no, Japanese. no, no, bro. I'm talking about like before too. the internment camps, bro. Before the internment camps, like South Carolina, like they was they was doing right. shit in the rice fields. They were doing shit in the rice fields before the internment camps, so bro. This is, I mean, what like eighteen, like early eighteen hundreds? Are we talking eighteen hundreds for sure? Eighteen hundreds yeah. for sure. Well, no, I mean, I mean, yeah, like obviously there was, uh, you know, at the brink of industrialization and people started moving around. Uh, a huge population of Chinese came to Canada for to, that were essentially, uh, I mean, I, I just fucking hate using the, the term slave labor, but like it's what it was. And uh, to build the transnational uh, railway. And there are like reports of, Fucking dudes, just like they would be like, okay, you know, here, uh, take this dynamite. You need to blow that section up, and they would just like die. They just like fucking explode, like, they, and they just kept, and they would fucking stack, like, just bury the bodies, like at the job, like on the the side of the railroad. Oh god. Anyway, it was fucking just, sad. Damn, bro. Yeah, and then I mean, even like in where I'm at right now, Vancouver, we like huge uh, Chinese population. It's just like um, it's 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 such a complicated thing too. And like Chinatown, you know, Vancouver's small in, in the terms. I mean, our population numbers are nothing compared to the states. Like uh, the state of California has a higher population, I think, than Canada itself. Um, but like, so our, our Chinatown is like right now at the point you know it was kind of developed in the in the 40s and the to, throughout the 60s and so now you know all these old buildings are reaching their last legs and all these developers are coming in and it's just getting like fucking flattened and gentrified and all these 
OG, like original Chinese families who have been here for generations are just like, they literally have nowhere to fucking go because there's no government support and they literally don't have any fucking money. So it's like, and they're just getting like, I don't even know what's going on. Like no one knows. It's, it's fucking crazy. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Sorry, I'm kind of going on a tangent now. No, that's okay. Let, let's recenter a bit because I have to get yeah. out of here. But I wanna, I do want to recenter just a little bit before we officially sign off. Um, if you guys all feel comfortable a- answering, my question for each of you before we go would be: What do you think is the next crucial step to what's going on right now? Like, what do you personally think people should be mobilizing most of their efforts around right now as it relates to this movement um, in America with these protests? And also, I mean, Rachel, you as well, how, how it relates to Canada, if you think that there's a relevance to you participating in what's going on in America and what what this is for the world, I don't know. I'd like to hear from everyone what you think is the next step, what we should be doing. Lex, can you answer? Uh, yeah, I, I, I... I said Lex. Oh, sorry, I thought you said can you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm going in order. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, I think right now the conversation is kind of moving towards um, funding. So I think we should prioritize, you know, what you know communities are spending on their police and their police and you know, rebuilding the communities that they're fucking destroying. And secondly, you know, I guess more it's more tangible to think about funding in my mind, but I mean next step being, you know, taking on you know justice system really mm. and do you think that it's, that's... Just, it's just so hard to think about the justice system. mobilizing you have to have a goal right now the goal is so wide and it's different in, within every community that you're in whatever state whatever country whatever fucking area you're from so it's like depending on where you are I think that you could do. Do you think that that represents a problem that the scale of what needs to be addressed is so wide that people aren't sure where to start and that potentially they might be starting at the wrong places when maybe there's more strength to be found in us all concentrating our efforts on one specific thing? Absolutely. I think when you have these movements, when you have these communities that are coming in, together to fight for a cause you have to have a set agenda if you do not set this agenda or have a goal in mind that's tangible that is achievable i mean the people are going to lose interest in that fight because they aren't winning the they aren't winning anything i mean we have justice for george floyd i mean possibly you know i mean he still has to go to trial and everything but and these have to be things that people get excited about. People, you know, see that they're winning these battles that they're fighting. And if they're not winning these battles, then they're not going to keep the movement. So, yeah. So that's a real concern, too, losing steam. Because, I mean, the people that have always been fighting this battle will continue. But what happens when all of this peripheral support disappears what happens when white people go back to their desk jobs and their comfortable lives you know and aren't aren't out here for protests and shit anymore you know exactly well thanks corona (laughs) (laughs) we won't be going anywhere for a for a minute well um yeah thank you life torn what do you what do you feel about this question what what do you think is the most important thing people should be doing if you want to answer i mean no one has to answer but regarding this uh based off like uh i'm I'm glad you mentioned the corona like what they said like the next maybe like even past christmas and all this other stuff that we're going to be going through 
Like I'm I'm scared like what's gonna happen during like the next coming months is it terrifies me because I just feel like either like people are gonna die during this protest or like cops are gonna kill more of us during like the next couple coming months unless we're just like really on our shit. And if we aren't on our shit, then it's just gonna be like, well, fuck, it's gonna be like <sighs> It's, it's going to be like that kid who got his fucking organ stuffed with newspapers all over again. It's like, how the fuck did a black kid get his his, his organ stuffed with newspapers? It's like, even then, I, I think about it sometimes because I was in Georgia. It's like, did anybody read those newspapers? I don't read. I don't read newspapers. That was when I was in middle school. Now that I think about it, like the fuck, Kendrick Johnson, that was his name. I believe that it. story is crazy. Yeah, like that shit terrifies me. That shit absolutely fucking terrifies me. What what was the name? Kendrick. Kendrick Johnson. Yeah, it was a young uh, black student in a high school or middle school who was found dead in the school's up, gymnasium. And, yeah, he was in, like, a gymnasium mat, and his internal organs had been removed. Like, there was a newspaper inside of his body. And people and think was that he was Georgia. killed for his organs. Yeah, I, I think that that kind of thing absolutely goes on, you know? And I think that that's a really uh, worthwhile fear to have, especially, like, what we were just saying, you know? If white people all of a sudden now withdraw their support or slowly withdraw their support as they go back to work and the economy and stuff, what kind of ramifications would this kind of a desertment have for the black community if no efforts or, or if nothing is won, then it seems like the police might now act with a vengeance, you know? Like, look what you put us through for all these months. Now everybody hates us. Like, even white people hate us. They've cut funding from our departments. Like, and, and then if white people leave, they will leave the black community, like, totally vulnerable, even more than before, you know. Cops absolutely, like, already exist in this crazy, almost psychopathic, well, actually legitimately psychopathic mindset. Like, it's, it's scary to think about people withdrawing support or nothing. Something has to happen. At this point, it's, it's gone too far. If it doesn't, then the black community will be left even more vulnerable than before. And also to racists, you know, who want to do whatever the fuck they're doing. They already work with the cops and shit. There's always cops being exposed as members of various right-wing groups. Like, but what do you think, Torn? Like, what do you think is the next step? Like, for, for what do you think needs to happen to secure wins? Honestly, I feel like, and I, I talked to someone about this uh, about a maybe a day or two ago, I felt like we're fighting a losing fight because I was looking at another thing too, and I I hate to be so fucking cynical. And there was a there was an officer named Christopher Dorn who was shot down, and he was killed. And I'm not sure who exactly killed him, but like on the cameras, it showed a bunch of black people, and it's like a lot of black on black violence that goes down too. Like think about it, bro. XXX Centacion himself xx Tentacion, he was killed by black people like we can't just get in the way of ourselves how does this shit fucking happen how does this shit fucking work like if x was alive right now i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure shit would be a little bit more different but like even then it's just fucking wild i I don't I don't pay attention to too many fucking people. Like I I even read like a couple other people they were just like, "Man, we can't fucking rely on uh celebrities and artists just like fucking be on our side and everything like that." But like even like you, like Buttress, like you're fucking you're you're one of the greatest fucking people. Like I I knew like when I when I fucking paid the the money that I did for this shit, I was like, "Yo, this is Buttress. What the fuck? <laughs> like, I, I know this is going to be You don't got to pay shit. for this shit. I made this, I made this free for everyone because this yeah, should not be behind a paywall. No, I was like, I know this but is going to be some real it. shit. I know this is going to be some real shit. It doesn't fucking matter. It doesn't fucking matter because, like, regardless, this is going to be, like, this is going to come back out in the community in the best possible way because I was like, I don't care. I know who this is. Nobody's going to fucking understand. I feel like 
I feel like people need to understand and even then it's like this conversation needs to fucking happen just for it to fucking happen. And I'm mm-hmm. glad regardless. I'm just like, fuck man, people care. It's like wait, people really do care. So it's just like stuff like this, like more conversations like this in itself needs to happen. But it's like in the end, the best way that we can do it is just through I guess in a sense we just need to get loud. We we really we really need to get loud. Like I remember they were talking about like there was gonna be a silence on Tuesday for music artists and all that bullshit. Nah, fuck that shit. Nah. Mm mm. We right, gotta I get saw loud. some conspiracies about that people were saying, and I think it's a it's a, a worthwhile point to consider. People were saying that they think people were trying to get people to be quiet, you know, because when everyone posted their black square and shit with the hashtags for Black Lives Matter and stuff, like people couldn't even see where protests were going on anymore because they a lot of people rely on their Instagrams and Twitter feeds and stuff for this kind of information because it's not being published in the news and they're just scrolling through and it's just this endless sea of black squares and, and even now it's going to go back for so many, you have to scroll so far to see all the other shit before all that, you know. So exactly, I mean, there's definitely like, a conspiratorial edge to that. I think it deserves some merit. It's like everybody has their own voice. A lot of us aren't really activists. A lot of us aren't really out here to just be like, we aren't. We aren't just here to be like the the leaders. A lot of us are not leaders. We can't fucking lead for shit, cause. Because everybody has fucking attention fans of fucking 5th graders, 6th graders, 7th graders, ninth graders. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> That's but the like, max. That's the cutoff point. Ninth grade attention I'm, I'm going to cut it off at ninth grade because, like, <laughs> I, I'm scared for the next generation. Like, even then, like, there's, there's a whole lot of more bullshit that's coming out right now. But, like, um, there's, there's, there's a... We we just gotta get loud. That's that's how I feel. That's that's how I feel. We just gotta get loud and proud. We need to be really about our shit and say what we really wanted to fucking say in the first place. Even if it hurts, if we can fucking interpret it in the way that we felt like we can interpret it. Because a lot of us, man, we aren't mathematicians. We're artists. We're poets. We understand. We can fucking read. We know the dictionary. We can tell these fucking legislators what the fuck we're talking about. Right. I don't even know Thank what the you. fuck they're talking about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the fucking second fucking amendment. They don't even know what the fuck they're talking yeah, about. Yeah, they can't even get a sentence together. What the fuck is that sentence? Like. Well, oh, yeah. What? Hold on. Let me. Okay. Can, can I? Is he? Are you done, Torn? Are you? Are you still have more to go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Put it out there, man. I um from. I think there needs to obviously there is a shitload of restructuring that needs to be done. Like this, it's not about inclusion or anything. It's about rebuilding. Um, and I also think a major part of this is admitting and acknowledging, um, which you still don't see a lot of. Um, the uh, in 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 what's happened in Canada a few days ago, our our prime minister was the f- first person to ever admit that there is a form of systemic racism in Canada and he got fucking tongue lashings from everyone um so i think a big part of you know in order for everything to go forward is that the you know i it's so weird saying the people who are in opposition but i mean what i was thinking is like it, to be opposed to hold on, I, I fucking wrote this down because it. Uh, one second, give me give me two seconds here. Two seconds. Yeah. Stand by, stand by. Uh, fuck. Where is it? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, hold on. Oh, almost there. Okay, to engage in discussion opposing the validity of the current movements regarding First Nation rights, Black Lives Matter or any group oppression for that matter is in itself denial 
of the humanity to those who have and are being affected by the ongoing state of affairs. So, like, there's there's literally no there's there's no argument. Like, I don't understand all this opposition and all this shit you see on social media about you know just follow the curfew rules. Like, you know, it, 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 I don't I don't even know the arguments. There's there's literally no point in in arguing. Um, there there needs to be an acknowledgement and an understanding that the system is fucking broken and then you need to figure out how to, there like honestly probably needs to be uh a rebuilding of like just a brand new constant like a rewriting from scratch like why can't they just get some old, what you know like like i think you guys were I, I briefly checked in like a few hours ago and you guys were talking about the constitution and all these you know it's how this shit is just so outdated so like why is everyone so butthurt about rewriting it like, I don't know what they have to lose. And all this shit about, you know, these monuments getting taken down and, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's not about not being racist. It's about Southern pride. And it's like, yeah, but that Southern pride is fucking racist. Like, it's massive, massive restructure, education. You know, I don't even know if it's necessarily about defunding the police. It's about re, re, uh, rebuilding what it means to be a, a, an officer you know like you know there's lots of talk about how there should you know it shouldn't th there's too much not pressure is not the right word there's too much uh expected from a police officer so you know like 90 percent of the the police calls in vancouver should be uh like in the downtown core because we have a massive homeless drug uh, addicted uh, addiction problem um and 90% of the calls like should be dealt with by social workers because the, the police simply aren't equipped to deal with like the, the, with, with these people. And you need people who, there are people who literally study this stuff. Like all a cop knows is every solution to a problem is on his belt. And you know, it's obvious, it's becoming obvious now, you know, um, I, I so I mean uh, to answer the, the question, I think it's it's literally needs to be an acknowledgement and an acceptance of you know you of them being uh, be, being the people who are the, you know essentially the root cause of all this, um, and then go from there. I mean, it's like isn't that a part of the twelve step program? Is it is it acknowledging you have a problem? Right. I don't know. Does that make sense? I think yeah, if they, you don't want to acknowledge <clears throat> uh, racism, we because it's like we didn't start racism. We didn't start it, so it's not our problem. It's not our thing, even if we're racist. Yeah. Well, I think what Rachel just said, the sentiment that you just said, is a good place to wrap up the discussion. The sentiment <laughs> that what needs to happen first is an acknowledgement, not necessarily as some sort of moral retribution or apology, although no, I think yeah. people do need yeah. to come to this also on individual terms with themselves, because like Zul just said, I think for a lot of people, it's too personal an issue, especially for white people. They don't, they can't separate any of this from their own feelings about themselves. And so they don't want to acknowledge that there's a problem because to them, that means that they're complacent in a system, you know, and also, especially in America, where we love underdog stories and you hear from everyone and their uncle like my great grandpa came on a boat from Ireland and had with a nickel in his pocket and I can I did this you know like it's this sense of people like to think that everything they have they earned if you tell people we exist in a racist society where certain people are disadvantaged because of the colors of their skin that wounds the ego of all the white people who think that everything they have in their life is the direct result of all the work they put in and this is why there's such a, a a desire to neglect this neglect and to deny that we live in a racist society because that diminishes their own accomplishments in the eyes of themselves and also in the eyes of society and people need to get over this you know but beyond this this acknowledgement of the problem is also necessary from a practical standpoint too because like we're all talking about in here the issue is so large 
that first of all, we need to really be able to comprehend it. We need to be able to understand it. And that requires acknowledgement exactly of what the problem is and a clear articulation of what the problem is. And also because the problem is so ma uh, so massive, I think being able to come up with some sort of a stepwise approach to taking care of it, you know, because like Lex was talking a little bit about like the order of things being done, you know, even this becomes a variable. Like, what do we do first? Do we defund first? Is that the best strategy? It needs to be mentally approached almost like a strategy of war, you know, weaken the opposition and then go in and try to take care of the judicial system. You know, like, do we what do we do first? What do we do in what order? We need to address this incredibly long laundry list of problems. We need to fucking see what it is we're really up against because we see the byproducts and the consequences of the system we're in but we need to actually be able to observe the structure itself if we want to be able to dismantle it and that's why you know these conversations really are essential and they i think that they are useful to anybody who wants to be an active participant in this battle you know and thanks, Torin, for the validation for saying that you think these discussions are useful. I hope that they are. And we're going to continue doing them weekly for the next few weeks at least, but hopefully longer because this is absolutely important. And essentially, you know, it, we have to strategize. Strategy is the only thing that's going to be able to help here, you know. So... Thank you all for coming to this discussion. I'm going to upload it for those of you who came late or whatever. I will I can keep it unlisted unless, I mean, I don't know, you, Torn and Lex, you guys were probably most of the, the most vocal participants. You can let me know how you feel about that. I was going to upload like, I was going to upload it and link it in here. I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you think that it should be public or people might be wanting to listen to this? I'm fine with I'm cool with yeah. it. Okay. Maybe I'll just make it public then. Um, Cause yeah, I think I think it would be good if people are exposed to this because also I think it's really a mindset issue. A lot of people want to be useful in this battle, but I think they don't even really have the mindset yet to do this. Like how to even think about these issues in a certain framing that can be useful, you know, and also just where to start. But I think that if we all are trying to be good critical thinkers the more we sharpen that tool set for ourselves the better outcomes we'll have you know so thanks all so much for participating in this with me and if you didn't read the text please read them um or one or both um they're really great and i'm gonna post the or the one text was really great the constitution is just the central reading um, I'm going to post the reading and discussion for next Sunday by Tuesday, so we'll have more days to read this time. And I'll, I'll find a shorter reading because I don't want people to not be able to read the full text. The anarchism text was a little long. Um, but let me know, too, if you have any suggestions. Um, so, yeah, thank you guys so much. And let Amen. me know if you have uh, suggestions and shit. We need to follow the drug policy of Portugal. I think that's one of the big things that Thank needs you. to happen. Hey, let's uh, not do that right now. We've been here for four and a half hours. I'm, but yeah, war on drugs, absolutely a variable. No, like, it's, it's, no, it's not a war on drugs. They essentially just decriminalized everything in 2000. No, I know. I'm talking oh, about okay. in the U.S., the war on drugs oh, right, right, is right, really right. just another racist agenda yeah. that's yeah, yeah, hidden yeah, yeah. with yeah. dumb ideology. But yeah, yeah, we're going to get out of here. Let's all reflect on what we've, what we've talked about. And we'll be here next Sunday. And thanks okay. and good night, everybody. Thanks, Lex. Good night. Yeah. Pleasure. And good thank night. you so much, Torn, uh, for your contributions. You were really vocal. Thank you. And you don't have to pay, oh, just so you know. It's it's public. I made this server to be thank free and public because I don't think that these materials should be behind a paywall, you know. The other server is behind a paywall, but you don't have to pay for that either, dude. I'll send you an invite link in the DMs. You can join us over there as well. To
All right, cool. I'll talk to you guys later, okay? Good night. I'll take mm -hmm. care. Good night. Good night.